covering Texas counties. And I need to take a moment to uh, recognize some of our TDM staff that, that not only is here in the room with us now, but were born in the Panhandle, raised in the Panhandle, lived and worked in the Panhandle for local government before they came to work for the state. That's Erica McDowell. She's our assistant chief for the region. She's in back there. You also have Brandon Miller, who started out as a as a Perryton firefighter, then a Pampa firefighter, then an Amarillo firefighter. He retired as deputy chief for Amarillo Fire. He's now a regional response chief. And Joe Minshew, not with us, who is your district chief for the 26 counties in the Texas Panhandle. Joe's also a local boy, worked for TDA before we stole him and, and now does our emergency management. Chairman, I'd like to talk specifically about Chapter 418 of the Texas Government Code. It's the Disaster Act of 1975. Uh, I get to have a lot of conversations with, with my friend and uh, chairman of one of my committees, uh, Chairman Wilson, who you recognized earlier, when we talk about the regulatory side of our agency. And Chapter 418 outlines the governor is the emergency management director of the state. The governor appoints the chief of the division of emergency management, who is also confirmed by the Senate. And by executive order, the governor creates an emergency management council. That's 36 state agencies and three volunteer organizations. Those emergency management council members are responsible for supporting our local partners, mayors, and county judges and their first responders. Chapter 418 outlines the duties of our agency, and it also outlines the duties of local departments and local officials. In Texas, all disasters are local. Disasters begin and end at the local level. Mayors and county judges own the responsibility for the preparedness, the response, the recovery, and the mitigation of their community. The state's job is to support local officials, not to second guess or overrun local officials. As we work together uh, with our council members, and I'll run through the list of the council agencies that were supportive of this fire with the Division of Emergency Management, it is the Texas Forest Service, the Texas Engineering Extension Service, AgriLife, Texas Animal Health Commission, the Commission on Environmental Quality, Texas Department of Transportation, Department of State Health Services, the Emergency Medical Task Force, Texas Military Department, our friends at the Department of Public Safety, and the American Red Cross. Those state agencies on the council and the volunteer organizations, again, are here to support the The governor of Texas does not have the authority to mandate an evacuation under state law. Only a mayor for the incorporated city limits or the county judge for the unincorporated area of the county. Now, there's, there's one time in state law that a judge's decision can overrule a mayor's decision, and that's in the mandating of an evacuation. If a mayor decides the threat to his or her community is such that it needs to be evacuated, the mayor has the authority to mandate an evacuation Everybody supports that mayor's decision. That's what the law says. If a mayor does, chooses not to evacuate a portion of their community, the county judge by law can overrule that mayor's decision and order an evacuation. Beyond that, private property rights are strong in Texas. Nobody else can order you out of your home. We support 254 counties and 1,216 cities in our agency. We are an all-hazards organization. We prepare, we respond, we recover, we mitigate, and we will talk more about those later in our presentation, and hopefully during the questions. Our job is also to keep an emergency management plan for the state of Texas and functional annex. If you will hear about basic plan, and then you'll hear about ESF-4 firefighting, which was the annex that was employed during this response. Also, by federal law and the grant funds that we receive, and by state law, all response organizations in Texas are responsible and required to follow the National Incident Management System, NIMS, and the Incident Command System. This sets the framework for all firefighters and first responders to be able to organize and communicate during disaster response. A little overview on timeline of events for this fire. We saw elevated fire conditions on February the 19th. Those fire conditions were first reported then to be in place on February 21st. On February 23rd, we ordered one TIFMA strike team. TIFMA stands for the Texas Interstate Fire Mutual Aid Assistance System. TIFMA is an organization of mostly paid fire departments that volunteer to come and support other fire departments. Sometimes TIFMA gets confused as a state program. The truth of the matter is TIFMAS is Fire Chief Helping Fire Chief and Firefighter Helping Firefighter. It is a mutual aid program. 
but in the mutual aid program from the state of Texas asked for firefighters to come from another part of the state, we, the state of Texas, pay those firefighters to respond to that area. And we'll talk about cost here in a little bit. But CITMAS sometimes gets confused as the state resources that are coming in. The truth of the matter is those firefighters are local government employees. They work for fire chiefs. They work for mayors and city councils. Or they work for an emergency services district. They volunteer to come be part of our state response system, and we send them wherever the need is. For this fire, obviously, the pandemic. For hurricanes, we send them down to the coast. We activated that TIFMAS team on the 23rd and had them in place on the 24th. The National Weather Service Amarillo reported critical fire weather conditions possible for the 26th through the 27th. Our in-house meteorologists continue to report those conditions. As the fire started on the 25th and the 26th, it quickly grew and we continue to serve additional resources into this area. Those resources uh, we will talk about a lot today and how they arrive, how they check in, how they coordinate, and how they support our local partners. I gotta tell you, this is an amazing system, but it's not perfect every day. There's always room for improvement in the way that the system operates. I started defining this system as a volunteer fire department made up of paid fire chiefs and firefighters. Because when we organize them and we send them in, they are volunteering to come. They still work for their home agency. We just pay the tab for them to be here during that time period. We'll talk about STARS, the State of Texas Assistance Request. STARS are when a local government sends an official request to the jurisdictions that started on the 27th and going through March the 20th. To date, state agency wildfire costs are just under $38 million. Our daily burn rate for the resources that we still have in the theater today in the panhandle and where our fire weather conditions exist is a little, uh, just under $800,000 a day is what taxpayers should pay in to have the aircraft that are sitting on the tarmac right now and the Tipness firefighters from out of region. A little under $800,000 a day. The state of Texas will be responsible for all but about 234000 of that uh, $812,000 a day burn rate. Now, we will keep that, those resources here in theater as long as the threat exists. But I need to make sure that everybody understands that is unallocated funds to the state of Texas. That money will come from the Governor's Disaster Contingency Fund, not from any of the state agencies that are currently participating. Out of the 812,000, roughly 35,000 a day comes out of the Forest Service budget. The rest of it, we will be coming back to the Governor's Office and the Legislature to fund next session. We'll talk a little bit about federal grants. Federal grants, a grant that we did not get, but you will hear a lot about, is the FEMA Public Assistance Grant Program, the FEMA PA program. That is a program where the federal government will give uh, some of our tax money back to us, and it comes at a 75-25 match. The state of Texas needs $54 million of uninsured public loss before we're eligible for a public assistance grant. Now, that is local government cost and state agency cost, that $54 million is not ag losses, private property losses, homeowner losses, or private business loss. So this is the FEMA Public Assistance Grant Program. With our cost today, we're not eligible for that program. The next program that people will ask about is the Individual Assistance Program. It's referred to as IA. Another federal grant program, it's listed in 44 CFR section 206 of the criteria for it. It's not as dollar-centric or prescriptive as the PA program is. The thumb rule is Texas needs 800 homes, major damage or destroyed, without insurance before we're eligible for that program. We will not qualify for the IA program. You've heard about the Fire Management Assistance Grants, FMAGs. An FMAG fire is a federal grant program under FEMA. There are strict criteria for it. We did receive two FMAG grants for the Smokehouse and the Windy Deuce fire. We did not receive FMAGs for the other because they were either not of the right size 
were already under containment or some degree of containment or did not have homes being threatened and mandatory evacuations in place. Those are criteria set by the federal government. So we will see 75 cents on the dollar for our expenses for the fire departments and the counties in the FMAG fires. Now that's going to be about, uh, about 90 fire departments across the state of Texas because the Tipness firefighters get reimbursed through that about 31 local fire departments and uh, seven counties will be eligible for the FMAGs. Talk a little bit about the future. And the future is we, wanna, we will have after action reviews uh, scheduled early uh, in April and May for our communities because we know we can always learn from the last response to make ourselves better for the next response. It will be a long road to recovery. We'll continue to work with our federal and state partners and our volunteer organizations. I mean, I listed off of the state agencies, but we didn't talk a lot about the volunteers that just showed up from all over the state of Texas. Those that brought hay, those that bring fencing, those that bring fence posts, those that do everything they can to pour out their support for the, the livelihoods that were destroyed here and impacted here. We will continue to coordinate those efforts and resource anything that we can. And, and again, we're not leaving. State of Texas is here. You heard that the TDM leadership lives in the panhandle. They're, they're, they're from this area. They're not going anywhere. And so, Chairman, I've, I've said a lot. I'm happy to start answering any questions if it pleases the Chair. Members, questions? Chairman Burks. Chief K. first off, obviously, uh, I have a lot of respect for you, your agency, what you have done. Um, and I, I learn by asking questions. That's kind of the way this works. I think for many of us, this is a little bit new. Let me, let me just kind of start at the basics. Um, is there kind of a, a written plan when something like this happens? Who's going to respond and how it's going to be coordinated? Yes, sir, there is. Okay. Who, who is in charge of developing that plan and where is it kept? So, great question, sir. There is a state plan that our agency is in charge of promulgating and developing and training that plan. Each county in Texas, by statute, is required to have an emergency management program. Each county is required to have an emergency management plan. Cities may have a plan under the statute. Counties must have a plan under the statute. Is, the pl is there plans that are tailored to multi-county wildfires such as this? Yes, sir. Plans and training and exercise. Talked a little bit about the National Incident Management System, NIMS, which was really heavily integrated after 9-11. Are you able to provide that portion of the plan to this committee so that we can take a look at actually what is written as far as what the plan is supposed to be for this type of incident? Absolutely. Okay, and then you said there's training. Yes, sir. Uh, how often does the training occur? Uh, training is ongoing. So with the state our size and our, our sister and agency partners that do training across the state, a lot of the incident management training is online. FEMA through the uh, Emergency Management Institute, EMI, offers free training to any responder. IS 100, 200, 700, and 800 are the basic principles of incident command and incident management. They are online. Anybody can go and take them. So is the training kind of like, you know, we're, we're testing and we're filling out, you know, multiple choice answers, or is it actually physical, let's get together and let's, you know, you know, go through a mock exercise that the conditions exist and there's multiple fires in multiple counties? Yes, sir. The National Incident Management System sets both. So in that training, 100, 200, 700, and 800 are online. ICS 300 and 400 are in-person NC classes for incident management. How frequently is the actual, you know, and I say mock, and maybe a better word for it, but I mean, how frequently does everybody get on the phone and say, let's spend the day going through this happening? How many times a year does that actually take place? So in, in the state agency land, it happens very frequently because of we're, we're the number one state for disasters in the nation. So we are constantly in the State Operations Center in Austin working together and training our new employees and reinforcing that training. As we work down from the state to the local level, counties set their own training requirements of when that should happen and how often they should come together. Do you have an idea of how often, how frequently per year the counties in this region are actually going through that exercise? Uh, I don't have one for each county in this region. I would bet they do it very frequently and you're going to have some experts that can answer okay. that question coming so up behind me. Fair enough. We will, we will find that out. So who decides, you know, TIFMIS, you say that's a volunteer organization, is that right? Yes, sir. Um, 
who oversees what volunteers are having access to TIFMAS and are going to be deployed during certain circumstances? Yeah, I want to make sure that I'm cleaning up my language a little bit. So TIFMAS is a voluntary organization. It is not necessarily volunteer. volunteers because we are compensating those. They're already paid certified firefighters for their home agency. They volunteer to come and participate in the program. It is organized by a stakeholders group that's made up of the Texas Fire Chiefs Association, the State Association of Firefighters, um, the Commission on Fire Protection, the Forest Service, TDM, um, I think there's one other agency that, and then local fire chief officers in each of our regions are the ones that work with the local departments in order to call them up and activate them. Are there groups that want to be part of this organization that are not allowed to be or denied access to being part of the TIFMIS response? There could be if they don't meet the minimum qualifications and training standards to be a member of TIFMIS, yes sir. Who sets those? The stakeholder group sets those. Okay. Um, one of the things I, I've, I've kind of heard, and obviously I've come into this with a completely open mind, Lubbock is not yes, really the panhandle, but you know, so many people I know are affected by it, is I, I hear that, you know, perhaps we didn't fully engage all of our local assets that could have been available that maybe have um, uh, equipment that would be more tailored to suit this type of fire incident, whereas we, you know, got people who are more experienced with structure fires. And so what I'm trying to find out is, is there, is there a need to kind of go back and take a look at who's part of the TIFMAS response and who's actually responding? And I'm sorry, I'm going to call you Chairman Burroughs. So just Dustin's <laughs> fine too. I, 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 so, uh, Chairman, we, we would love to have another conversation about this. We continually have conversations. The, the TIFMA stakeholder group gets together at a minimum once a year, and we just met together in, in Waco a week or two ago. The thing that I want to be careful of is, and you're going to hear more from experts in later panels about state certification through the Commission on Fire Protection, certification through State Firefighters and Fire Marshals Association, and then no state certification. Yeah. And, and a little of my background, again, I, started as a volunteer firefighter in Lavernia, Texas. There was no training requirements to be on the fire department in Lavernia. It was show up. And, and I think over the years, all volunteer fire departments have gotten better in that. But today, in order to be compensated as a firefighter, you must complete training and pass a state test by the Texas Commission on Fire Protection. And, and the majority of the property in Texas is covered by volunteer firefighters. And those volunteers are experts in what they do, but they don't necessarily have the same training or certification that paid firefighters do. And, and to your question, I would love to have a group set together and let's figure out what it looks like going forward for volunteer and paid firefighters to work hand in glove together. Jim Kidd, final couple of questions and I'll let somebody else uh, take a, a, a ask theirs that they may be waiting for. I also hear that maybe we didn't have all of the resources that we needed available when we needed it, specifically aircraft. Um, I you know, understand that we have a contract where we relied upon the federal government to you know, supply us with fixed wing aircraft when we need it to help this. And for whatever reason, somebody made the decision to not have those available exactly when we needed it. Somebody in DC made the decision to not have those deployed down here when we need it. Um, I'd like to know if there's some truth to that, and if, do you have an idea of who made that decision, if that is the case? So I can answer that, and then we'll have some of our friends on the right answer it with their testimony as well, but the state of Texas today does not own fixed-wing firefighting aircraft. I, I hope we can revisit that. That's part one. Part two is the fixed-wing firefighting aircraft that you see in Texas today are most wholly privately owned and they're under contract. The way that Texas has used a risk management approach to when we contract aircraft, and I'm going to work my way backwards to this, so if you give me just a little bit of time to answer this, of when we contract aircraft has been based on fire conditions. But those contract aircraft are not always available through the U.S. Forest Service contract. So we saw this during COVID when we started competing with every other state in the nation for resources, the price went up. When the federal government started buying, the price standardized, and we all got our federal allocation of the stockpile, which was not ideal for us Texans. We never got our fair share out of it, from my perspective or opinion. 
but it did level the playing field and reduce the cost across the board. We see the same thing on contract aircraft. The U.S. Forest Service holds that contract for those aircraft. We could, we have not yet, we could go and set private contracts with some of those aircraft, but then we would be subject to paying those contingency costs or those retainer costs while they're sitting on the tarmac. T today, we're paying a portion of that. It's about $320,000 a day for the aircraft to set around. 85000 of that 320000 will be borne by Texas taxpayers, the balance out of the federal share to get some of our money back out of D.C. Does Texas need its own aircraft? If you ask me that, my answer is yes. Did the federal government not have the contracts in place before this fire started? The answer to that is yes, they did not have those contracts in place ahead of time. Did they jump through their hoops at the staff level to get those aircraft available? Yes, they did, but they were late to the game. Why were the contracts not present when we needed them? So, if you know, I mean, I, that, that may be something for D.C. to answer, but do you know? It will be something for D.C. to answer, but I believe our partners here at the table also have a little more answer to that as well. My perspective answer is that is aircraft have downtime, they have maintenance time, they have training time, and this was not a busy fire season for them. My what belief, does that mean? Uh, across the rest of the nation, we're, they are not in wildfire season yet. We're, we're two or three weeks away from without waiting for Number two, let's cut right through it. Tell this group right here, what are you asking the legislature to do in January? I think I want to see the research that comes out of this group. We're going to have our after action reports, and then I want to come back and, you know, I've already got takeaway notes here. Before you take action, Chairman, I would like to get more volunteer firefighters and their associations together to talk about TIFMAS. We shouldn't leave qualified people out of the program, and if we're doing that, that needs to change. So what cash asks do you think should be made of the legislature? Uh, my hope is that we will talk about owning our own aircraft in the state of Texas and where those are positioned and the agencies that should be responsible for maintaining and keeping them ready. I hope that we can have conversations about equipment for fire departments across this state. And and training for fire departments. And you'll be able to, uh, with the local folks, help Chairman King and Chairman Bowles with the amounts to be asked. Yes, sir. Okay, good. It's premature right now for me to give you that answer because we haven't had the conversation with them yet, Chairman. But you could so that they have an amount to take to the legislature. Yes, sir. Next, in your opinion, I mean, this, we're up here in the panhandle. They had a bad, 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 bad fire. In your opinion, were the locals prioritized in engagement or not? Can you expand the question? Well, you know, when I have a hurricane, I always like people 
calling me, telling me what to do from their TV set in a hotel in another part of the U.S. So my point is, did they engage the local folks here? They know the area. They know the topography. They may know where the fire is. In your opinion, were the local people engaged and relied upon? I think every incident in the early stages of the incident, you have communication gaps that through an incident management system, when an incident management team is put into place, get refined. There is no different in this fire and any other fire that is a multi-jurisdictional, multi-disciplined response. The beginning stages of every fire or every response have communication gaps. And so, I, 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 Chairman, I, gotta be, I wanna be very clear in the firefighters in this area did expert work. The firefighters that came in to support them could always have done a better job in tying in with them, but it, you know, when you're in the middle of the fight, you don't have time to hit the pause button and get everybody up to, to speed on the same page. That usually takes what we call an operational period, and we try to run in 12-hour operational periods. It's usually not until the third operational period that we have improved and really tied in all of our communication schedules. Bottom line, though, were the locals involved? I'm going to have to say yes, all disasters are local. They are the authority having jurisdiction. We didn't have a bunch of state and federal people coming in telling them what to do. Uh, you may have had state employees coming in to coordinate that response, and the federal teams that came in should have never told locals what to do. It is a joint incident management, what we call a unified command. But all disasters are local, the that that, reign supreme. Is that that relationship to that FEMA group? Uh, no, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we're saying the same thing, Chairman. I, no, no, I think there might be bloodlines from federal to federal is what I'm talking about. My point is, Federal should allow state and local to have a little bit more engagement and not interfere. The federal resources that came in were to organize the fire response and make sure that we had the right assets. Decisions are still made at the local level. And we want them to be at the local level. I will, I will put my stamp down. All disasters are local. If anybody comes in and tries to tell a county judge what to do, I want to meet that person. I'll escort them out of the state. I want you to know members, old, old chief here, he knows how to dance around these questions. He's a, he's a pretty trained guy. That's why he's headed. You taught me well. Thank you. I want to thank Blair because after our incidents, Blair talks with my office. So I have a constant communication. So bottom line, chief, get the money request at some point to our members here so we can back you all up. And number two, my theme from somebody, because I'm the youngest one up here, that's why I dress in black. These witnesses need confessional half the time, you all. The, uh, but remember this, we always want to focus on the local region. They know their area, they know their operation. When they get cut out, then that's when I think we're not doing our job. Yes, sir. They know the area. Uh, Chairman, thank you.
for the time because they've got full-time jobs, right? Yes, sir. How long do you think it should take for a volunteer fire department to get a piece of equipment from the Forest Service or from the state of Texas when, when they turn a grant in? Uh, in? In the perfect world, we would have a giant warehouse of that stuff ready to hand it out. Funding doesn't happen that way. Um, I think our Forest Service partners are going to be able to talk about a, um, an unmet needs request that local fire departments have asked for in resources versus the funding that's been appropriated to the agency. There's, there's quite a delta there, quite a gap. Um, you know, and, and we see this, we talked about the east side and west side of I-35, right? This is, this is a little off script for me, but I want to have a, a genuine conversation with you. Growing up in a volunteer, starting in a volunteer fire department, seeing what it's like to have to work on our own trucks because we didn't have mechanics, have to have hand-me-down bunker gear and structural protective clothing and air packs because we couldn't afford to buy them, having our communication systems that were hand-me-down or, you know, patched together because today the radios that most of us carry around are about $8,000 a piece. Uh, and then not having any support from the cities or the counties that we responded to as well we went out and we did our bake sales and we did our fish fries and we did our fill the boot campaigns so that we could put gas in our truck and pay for the uh, VFID insurance program. Then you go into cities and counties that put tax dollars to hire a paid fire department. And it, it, is, it truly is a, com a difference between the haves and the have nots. The fire's just as hot, the dangers are just the same, the dedication to the job is equally the same. And I would say more so from the volunteers because they're doing it for the love of, of their fellow man. They're not doing it for the paycheck. Now the question becomes, how do we pay those volunteers and how do we make sure they have the same equipment to respond with that the paid fire departments do? And that, that's a tough question. We've been struggling for this, not, not just in this part of the state, not just in the state, but in this nation since the beginning of volunteer fire departments. And I, I, I don't think that there's a clean answer to this, although I wish there was. Yeah, and I, I don't think the volunteers want to be paid you know, I, I think I think the assistance is a big deal because I mean we're we're not just we're not just working in our county. They're they're mutual aiding all over. Yes, sir. So it's it's a it's a Texas problem, and when uh, when they've got grants in for trucks that's been over ten years, and they never get a truck. I mean, at some point, we you know pickups don't work here. We we have to have you know six buys. And all these guys, their youngest truck they've got sitting in their barn is probably 30 years old. And they're mechanic in it, and they're good mechanics, and they make it work. And then, the, then when, when you do say, well, we'll assist you, well, it's, it's pennies on the dollar. I mean, whenever you say, oh, yeah, we'll give you $20,000 to rig this truck up, well, you check around. You can't get a truck rigged up for, you're lucky to get it rigged up for under 100000 right? Right. I, I think if you can get it for 100000 you're getting a steal. Yeah. So, so what you have is these guys can't afford it. They don't have $90,000 sitting in the bank. So what, what are they doing? They, they can weld. They can mechanic. So their time off, when, when they're not at their everyday job, they're down there at the, at the shop building their own stuff. Yes. Scabbing it up. And whenever you get these guys that don't have time to go do their schoolwork because it's money out of pocket, they're in there welding on their trucks instead of sitting at home with their family. And you get the state of Texas or the, or the Forest Service or whoever shows up and say they, they're not qualified, it's a pretty big slap in the face, isn't it? Uh, as a volunteer firefighter myself that started in this business, I see both sides of that argument. I really do. I mean, they're the volunteers, the authority having jurisdiction, the local responders are answering every 911 call at the local level. Uh, but I got, I got to tell you, as a, as a volunteer firefighter and a paid firefighter, we kind of act the same way. Pull up on a car wreck, good Samaritan sitting on the side of the road trying to help, one of the first things the responders do is ask those folks to step back so that they can assess the situation. I, th I think we all do that as first responders, whether we're paid or volunteer. 
And so that's a mindset that we have got to work together to, to change. And whether it's fire or a car wreck or acts of mass violence, we have to do a better job of engaging our private sector partners, our citizens. We need to make sure that the citizens are going to be part of the solution and, and not part of the problem because we've all been there. We've all pulled up on a scene, paid or volunteer, where the people that are trying to help are actually causing more harm or they don't know the plan and they don't know the program and they don't know the communications. And I think this happens not just in the panhandle, this happens every 911 call in this state, probably in this nation, that the people that are responding will get on scene and try to do a size up and assess and they ask those that are already engaged in either providing care or, or trying to solve the problem to just pause for a second so that we can see what's going on and get our arms wrapped around this. Now, should that happen with kindness? Absolutely. Does it always? No, it, it does not. But we can do better at making sure that we have a tighter connection to our local partners here from all of our state agencies and our out-of-area resources so that when we come in to support you on your private property, we're not running you on your private property out of the way. You know your property better than we do, your resources, you know them better than we do. You know what you need done on that property. At the same time, the individual private property is usually not the only one impacted and is trying to take a look at that bigger picture and what we need to be doing to support all of the people that are impacted by the event. Right. Well, we, well I, w I wish you were out there on my ranch. I'd like to visit with you a time or two when we're fighting a fire and I'm trying to run the Forest Service off. Well, in next fire you have on your ranch, I will be standing beside I, you. I believe you. I believe you, and I've heard that about you. Um, but And that's why I'm asking you the questions more than other people because I... I want to get a real question. Here we go. Back to FEMA. And I, I, don't, I didn't know FEMA was such a... Which a it's a four-letter word. You can yeah, say it. <laughs> it sounds like it. But they tell me TDM is too, so I've got to be careful. So, so, so you're, you're saying we didn't qualify for FEMA. How big of a fire do we need to, to qualify for FEMA? And so what I want to try to explain is FEMA has multiple grant programs. We did qualify on two of the fires for FEMA Fire Management Assistance Grants. But those grants will only reimburse 75% of the cost of fighting the fire. It doesn't pay for any of the damages or any of the losses. In order to qualify for the governmental program, public assistance, we need $54 million of uninsured debris cost, response cost, or damage to government infrastructure. Private property owners will not qualify for FEMA public assistance or FMAX. They never will. It's not in the grant programs. Right, right. Now, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more thinking fire departments. Yes, sir. So out of the fire departments, 31 of the fire departments in the panhandle that responded to the Windy Deuce and the Smokehouse Creek fires will get reimbursement at some point. Now, and, and Chairman Hunter made reference to this. We started working with our local partners the, the Friday, I think, after the fire started. I got to look over here. I lost track of time. We met with many of our judges because we wanted to start tracking those costs the expenses and the receipts that day. It is a reimbursement program by the feds. You have to spend the money first. We have to prove that we've spent the money. We have to have the receipts, the contracts, and the invoices. We have to prove that they were paid, and then FEMA will reimburse that. Now, Chairman Hunter's point to people waiting seven years for FEMA, that's mostly on the individual assistance program. That's the money that goes to homeowners. We didn't qualify for that either. Out of the 400 plus homes that we had damaged, Many of them had insurance. I needed 800 statewide uninsured to be able to qualify for that program. That's why it's off the table right do, now. Do the fire departments have to have check marks beside their name to qualify? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Do, do they have to pass the test and, and be the qualified fire department to? Uh, no, sir. I understand your question. Yeah. No, they do not. Cool. I'll pass. Chief. Thank you, first of all, for being here today and, and being part of this. We appreciate what you do. Um, one of the big things I've heard about not only this fire, but numerous fires that we've had in the Panhandle is the communication coordination piece. Can, can you walk us through in a fire of this magnitude? Because it doesn't stop at county lines. It doesn't stop at city limits. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop at fire department jurisdictions or any of those kinds of things. How do you come into this situation and communicate with all of these different groups that are involved in something like this and begin the coordination? Because I'm, 
I hear a tremendous amount of complaints, but I'm not hearing how we typically try to solve any of those. Yes, sir. Um, if you read an after action report, whether it's the 9-11 after action report or any of them, you'll find that communication concerns are the number one area that, that we need to improve in on every disaster and every event. As we talk about communications, I like to, to divide it into two categories. There's technical communications and cultural communications. From the technical communication side, the $8,000 radios today can say they can talk to each other. Culturally, doesn't always work that way. Um, I, you're going to have people coming up behind me on other panels that will talk specifically about radio operability in the Panhandle, county by county, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. I want to give the high level answer to this is we as a nation and as a state have adopted interoperable communications channels that we urge local responders to have in their radios. Um, if, if you can imagine, and I know you're going to have some of our AT&T friends and others here, if you can imagine an AT&T cell phone, a Verizon cell phone, a T-Mobile cell phone, and a Sprint cell phone only being able to talk to to their network providers, meaning you and I have AT&T, but we can't talk to Chairman Hunter because he's on Verizon. That's a lot of how radios, public safety radios work today. If I'm on UHF, VHF, 700, 800, or 900 interops, if I'm on the wrong frequency, I can't communicate with those other people. As a nation, we have developed the incident management system where we try to put all of our communications onto a single page. Usually, we try to get that done in the first operational period so we can identify which radio frequencies and which radio systems everybody is operating from. In major events, it takes two to three operational periods to get everybody on that same comms plan because everybody begins operating on their local systems, and as outside resources come in, they don't have access to those local systems. We switch to mutual aid channels or interop channels, and that's where we start tiering our organizational structure. In the perfect world, in my mind, every public safety radio with a big knob on top, when you turn that thing all the way to the right, it should go to a common channel that we could all talk on. If I can get to that point, then I can back into more structured communications responses. But your local partners here need to explain the radio systems that they're on from county to county, what band of frequencies that they're on, and the types of channels that they respond to. We will bring our own in to support our networks, but then as soon as possible try to tie into those local systems if the local system can handle it. And frankly, not all parts of the states have local radio systems that can stand 800 to 1,000 new radios coming uh, to try in and join those local organic systems. And it's something that I think we all need to do a better job of prioritizing our interoperable communications. We do not have what people believe we should have in the state of Texas. And whether it's whether it's acts of mass violence, whether it's wildfires, whether it's hurricanes on the coast, every disaster we go to, we have flawed radio communication procedures and flawed communications platforms. We've got to do a better job of that in this state. So would one of those asks for the legislature be funds to try to help get communications systems to where we can communicate? Yes, sir. But I'll brace you now that that number is north of a billion dollars just to get started. But you got to start somewhere. Yes, sir. You know, we can't eat the elephant except one bite at a time. Yes, sir. Okay. Members, other questions? I've got a few. Yes, Surprise. sir. Surprise. Um, so, what, so while we're starting on communication, and, you know, I started this morning saying that it started the lack of communication started with uh, we didn't have any, any airplanes and nobody knew it. So my question is, on February 21st, you basically, in your testimony, I know I'm, I'm paraphrasing you here, Chief, but you said that that was when TDM activated and started sending resources. Yet, when the fire started, I was getting calls from my local officials saying, where's our airplanes? So my question is, if we knew on, tw on the 21st that we need to activate TDM, that it was that serious, why weren't our local judges and our local emergency management teams informed, hey, you're on your own as far as fixed wing air aircraft. We have no, we have no contracts. Yep. So, uh, Chairman, I'm going to back up and 
19th was when we started identifying the threat. 21st is when the threat was supposed to happen. 23rd was when we sent ground firefighting forces up here. Mm -hmm. um, all disasters are local. And I want to be very delicate about how I say this. We received no request for assistance from our local partners. Okay. We sent those resources on the 23rd without local request. It wasn't until the 26th when the fire started and the 27th when all of the meteorologists got together and said this is worse than we anticipated that it was going to be that we started looking for the uh, aircraft to come in. Very much understood, except we have tanks in Dumas, Childress. There's one Canadian that's not utilized. Um, and I get it. The county judges, the local emergency management did not call TDM and specifically ask. But TDM is my understanding that while these contracts are federal, they're signed with the Department of Emergency Management or the state of Texas. How was a county judge supposed to say, hey, make sure we got airplanes up here? I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I get if they didn't turn around, and, if they didn't call specifically and say, hey, we're about to have a fire, get up here. I get that. But knowing about the aircraft and how the contracts work, that was a failure in communication to the local level. I mean, certainly, if anybody said, hey, there's no aircraft available because uh, the federal government decided we don't have wildfires till March, somebody would have said, maybe we should get these contracts in place before the fire got out of hand. That's, that's my question. So um, we didn't have the airplanes, and nobody at the local level knew it. If we didn't know to, if, if the locals didn't know to ask, um, shouldn't have somebody known to tell us? Because after the 17 fires, you know, we went through a lot of this in 19 and actually expanded contracts where we had more resources that weren't all stationed in College Station. That's when we started staging resources in the Panhandle was after the 2017 fires. So I was very much a part of that in, in the 19 legislative session. So when I get a call and says, hey, Where's our airplanes? And I said, oh, they're in Childress. No, they're not. And the first I knew about it is when you and I talked a day into the fire before, the, before it really got out of hand. And I get and I and listen, I appreciate the work you did and your staff did to get that short-term contract in place. Also know that the federal government um, not inspecting the tank in Dumas for another three days or, or the paperwork coming was, was a disaster. There's all kinds of federal disasters. But my question is, if we're going to have our own airplanes up here, that needs to be part of what, what we're communicating. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to get on to something else with you before we let you go, because I want to talk about your CLO program as well. Because your CLOs are now in how many counties? We will be, we're in 80 today, we'll be in 100 by the end of the year. Okay, you're going to be in 100 counties, so you're taking over emergency management and you should have one in between every county. You even put one in Roberts County currently. Is that, that correct? Yes, sir. So there's going to be one between Hemphill County and, and Gray County. But yet nobody knew wildfires don't start till March. Now, I mean, from an airplane standpoint. And I think, that was a, I think that was the very first failure in communication between state and the locals. And then, then, it, then it progressively got worse. So I, I certainly think that needs to be addressed, whether we own our airplanes or we lease our airplanes. Um, number one, let's take the federal government out of it. You know you've got full support from, from me on that. Yes, sir. Um, on the communication theme, one of the, one of the things that, and I think uh, several um, of the committee members have, have touched on this, when, uh, when Texas Forest Service comes in, and they're operating on a channel that our guys don't have, and they don't know where where our people are, or where the roads are, or how to get to where the fire needs to be. I get it's a billion dollars to get everybody on the same channel, but I would ask that when you're ready to talk to um, the letter to me, particularly, and um, Chairman Burroughs, Chairman Hunter, after this after this committee has been disbanded. When, you, when you're when you ready to put together your legislative appropriation request, that be part of it. Yes. Communication, communication, communication. And there's no way you should ever, um, Forest Service or TDM, should ever roll into a disaster 
whether it's in my county or in Chairman Hunter's county, and not be able to contact with your local fire to communicate with your fire department just immediately. We shouldn't have to wait three days to get on the same channel. I think that that's that's a priority for me when we start talking about what we're going to pay for. This is more just your opinion, Chief. Um, when we talk about the amount of money we're to for Texas to have its own firefighting aircraft, at this point, and I know you said you wanted to learn more through the committee process, but are, is your feeling now, are we better off to uh, own a firefighting air force? And then, obviously, who's going to fly it, who's going to maintain it, where's it, where's it going to be staged? Or are we better off to have our own contracts with with private contractors still taking the federal government out of it or or a hybrid of the two what what is your thought um i know i know you and not holding you to it you get to change your mind as this committee process goes on but what's your thought right now on what's the best way to approach this from a from a legislative appropriation request yes sir i'm gonna work my way backwards i heard four points to to give you answers on i got a lot of questions so to start with on the air force I believe we should own our own, and it will not be an easy venture to start with, but we have, we have organizations in Texas today already that own aircraft, they're just not for firefighting. Whether it's the military department, whether it's TxDOT, whether it's the Department of Public Safety, we can work with those folks, we can learn from their programs, but we should own our own firefighting aircraft. It will take a period of time from the time that you give us the money to go do that until they're operational. For that period of time, we should contract so that we're not waiting to, to get it, to get it trained, to get the people, to get the resources. We should get some money to start with to start those contracts. People are going to ask, why shouldn't we only contract? We would be contracting with private sector partners every year or every two or three years by state legislation. We have to rebid those contracts. That would be a fluctuation in price, probably in off seasons to the legislature that will be unfunded that we're going to have to work through. And if I have a contract with a private sector partner and something happens to that organization, now I've lost the resource. So I, ha I don't have control of my own destiny, and I want control of our own destiny. I want us to be able to own our own. So to start with, get contracts in place until what you give us the money to buy, we can have operational. I got you. Working my way backwards. You asked about comms channels. Um, when we were in the Department of Public Safety, our agency had access to 254 county sheriff's radio frequencies. When we got moved out of the Department of Public Safety, I had about 60% of them tell us, you're no longer authorized to be on our channels. Wow. So it's very hard for me to have partnership with local officials when county sheriffs across this state and sheriff's offices have said, you're not cops anymore, you can't have access to our radio systems. When so many of our fire departments are dispatched by county sheriff's offices. so. I'm ready to have the conversation with y'all whenever you're ready to have so that conversation. Are you, are, so, so, and that, that is a local decision. That's yes, a county decision to whether or not they give you or the Forest Service That's access right. That's right. to the radio. That's right. That's they right. own those systems. They're their systems. We have to beg or pay a fee to be on their systems. Oh, okay. So, um, interesting. So, if every, all 254 counties said, um, TDM, even though you're not part of DPS, you have access, you believe that would solve a lot of this communication problem? It would certainly be a big step in improving it so that when our people come into that area, we are on the same channels that the locals are already operating on. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing from some locals on why that's a bad idea, because right now it sounds like a pretty good one to me. I, I think they'll agree with you, too. Okay. Um, uh, I had some others. We want me to finish? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, CLO program. We're not taking over emergency management at the local level. We are not. No more than, than DPS takes over from the sheriff's office. Our CLOs are there to be the single point of contact for that mayor and that county judge for the state of Texas resources. They are not there to run their local program. They are a human that lives in the community, works in the community, pays taxes in the community. Kids go to the school, go to church in that community. They're just like your AgriLife Extension agent, just like your county extension agent, except they're from TDEM. Their job is to be there to support those county judges and emergency managers, not take their jobs away and not take over. 
whenever you have to call us and it takes us four hours to respond, that's too long of a response time. When you call us, I want to put a TDM uniform in our local partner's pocket within minutes, not hours. That's the goal of the CLO program. Okay. You, you talked about aircraft contract. Our agency does not sign the annual aircraft contracts. We didn't sign any for this event. That's, that's a different agency. I think the Forest Service may talk about that, but my belief is the feds actually sign those contracts at our request to get the aircraft up that we're using right now. So we have not signed So nobody any from the state signs the contract for the feds to bring the resources in. It's just the federal government sends them when we request. I, I want the Forest Service to answer that question. I can tell you my agency does not sign that contract. I'll save that question for, yes. for, for, for a moment later. And I think I got all of them already. Did I miss anything yet? Nope. I think okay. we're good. Right, I've ready. got a couple more yes, sir. Um, clarification. Yeah. Uh, well, he doesn't have the contract. But if you ever see the contract, we'd like a copy of it. We'd yes, like to see that. Um, the okay, okay. So and I and we touched on this a minute a minute ago um, about the LAR and and what should be involved. And obviously, you know, we're talking about airplanes, but there's more than that. You know, um, personally, I don't ever want another rancher telling me that the Forest Service brought a bulldozer in and cut fire breaks three days after the fire was out. You know, motor graders, you know, other kinds of equipment that work better in the Texas Panhandle need to be part of this. I mean, and, and they need to be, and from a communication standpoint, the use of those need to be directed by the, by the locals to some extent. But I think when we're talking about resources outside of airplanes, ground resources that are appropriate for the region need to be part of this LAR request. Um, the trucks um, got mentioned about why we can't have military or to get the military trucks. The Texas Guard has lots of surplus six buys up there that are a heck of a lot newer than any. I see a bunch of my guys out there running 1960 model trucks. We got new trucks taxpayers have already paid for in the Texas Guard that aren't being utilized. One of the things, and you're probably not prepared to answer this question, I want to know how we can get our hands on those taxpayer resources that we've already paid for. I mean, these departments shouldn't have to buy them. Texas tax dollars have already paid for them. And if it is true that our military department is using some of these resources for target practice, I can tell you right now, Scott Brewster would love to have one of them. So we need to get to the bottom of that as well. and and however that needs to be funded or however, you know, call it gifting, you know, the Department of Military gives it to, to a local fire department. Um, 2604 grants, uh, and how they're structured, and, and there's, it, it seems to me that we have a huge problem with 2604 grant, not only getting money appropriated to the grant program, but getting the money out the door, and then our volunteers who need it the most are at the bottom rung. We need to talk a lot about about the 2604 grant program, and I'm going to save some of those questions for, for the Forest Service as well. Um, TIFMAS, and, and Chief, I, you and I had a great conversation about this. I was very disheartened when I, of course, I was looking at the wildfires and where the, where the wildfires were, and obviously when when Canadian, the South End Canadian burned down, some of those Tiffmas trucks were, were helpful, but by and large our communities were filled up with beautiful fire trucks, and to Mr. Abraham's point, they couldn't go to where the fire is. So would you please explain to us the difference in the, in the type of trucks that were sent up here and what their purpose was? Because most of us just saw a bunch of blinking lights and they were in the way. Um, we, under the National Incident Management System, fire trucks are tight, right? And so the, the smaller the number, the bigger or the higher the capability. So a type one engine is what you would call, a, I call it a BRT, a big red truck. It usually has four firefighters on it. It usually has 500 to 750 gallons of water. It can pump 1,000 to 1,250 gallons a minute. It'll have about 17, 
hundred feet of hose from five inch supply to two and a half or three inch down to attack lines down to booster lines and it's what you normally see on the streets of Corpus or Houston or Austin or San Antonio or, or right here in an urban or suburban environment. For the response, we sent five of those. Then we have what's called a type three, bigger number so a little smaller resource. That's more like a crew truck close to a six by six but nowhere near the off-road capabilities of a six by six but it is more dry, to be able to drive on paved roads to get to a scene as well and to have some off pavement capability. Then we go down to the type six, whether it's a pickup truck, a one ton, usually two door, four door, can be single rear wheel or dual rear wheel. We'll have anywhere from 150 to 300 gallons of water. Some will put four or 500 gallons of water, but it's hard on the springs and hard on the brakes. And those apparatus will pump anywhere from 50 to 200 gallons per minute versus the type ones that you see in, in 1,000 to 1,200 gallons a minute. So we want a type one to do structure protection. We want a type six to get into the areas that we can get off road um, as much as we can. Type six is usually run with only two people. You might get three people on a type six. Type three, the midsize, you're gonna get anywhere from two to four people on it. So that's, that's kind of the varying ranges. And again, a lot of these departments that you saw send resources here, Texas didn't buy those. Those were bought by that local community, sure. by that city or by that, that emergency services district. They paid for those fire trucks to be here. We reimburse them for the time that they're here by the hours that they're working here. But those trucks did not get bought through the state of Texas. They were bought locally. So to have a fleet of fire trucks that the state owns that is the right size by region because the same trucks that fight fire in the panhandle may not necessarily be good in the hill country, may not be good down in the coastal plains, right? So each part of our state has a different resource need. Mm -hmm. And when those individual resource areas don't have enough of that resource, you're gonna get what comes from the rest of the state. Well, and, I, and I, I'm glad you because that's the same explanation you gave me and it makes more sense uh, but I think it's important for the people in this room and the local res residents to understand that that's why we had the, that type of equipment up here yes sir. it was what we had but there 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 are some improvements to the TIFMA system we can make um, going forward yes sir thank you for that um, the last thing I want to I want to circle back to F mag um, and and you did a great job explaining the FMAG program, but I, I, we're sitting here in, in Gray County, and um, I think uh, our Gray County uh, um, officials will probably make, correct me, but it's my my understanding we lost uh, 35,000 acres in Gray County, and Gray County was one that was certainly affected by the smokehouse fire, but yet it Gray County didn't qualify for the FMAG. So it's the fire itself and the jurisdictions that are in and responding to that fire that qualify. If there were other fires, and we know there were other fires in Gray County that were not that fire, right. those other fires do not qualify. So for the, the part of the county that burned down by what was considered the Smokehouse Creek fire should qualify for FMAG or Gray County didn't at all? The, the resources from Gray County that responded to the Smokehouse Creek fire mm -hmm. do qualify. Okay. Any other fire in Gray County would not qualify. Only Windy Deuce and Smokehouse are the fires that we get FMAG grants for. Gotcha. Okay. And any, any entity that responded to those fires that tracks their cost and can prove it will get reimbursed. Okay. All right. Well, I, and, you, and I, I hope you're going to hang around because yes, when sir. we get to the county officials, they're going to have questions for you. I, I'm here all day as long as you're here, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Well, um, members, other questions for Chief Kidd before we move on? Uh, Mr. Edwards. Okay. Your radio problem, problem solved. You buy everybody a radio and you put your own programs in there and they will. I'm, I guarantee you all my guys will take their radios because they, 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 their radios are bad. Well, and we, we will take them and we'll, let you, we'll, let, we'll share it with you. Other problem with the radio is... And this might be more forest service than uh, and national forest services. Y'all are the worst about having your secret radio frequencies. The worst. 
So like whenever air attack comes in, you, they've got their own frequencies that are top secret for, for whatever reason. We've already been on the fire for two hours. All of a sudden, we get buzzed by a, um, by a King Air, by an air attack. They buzz us while we're down. We're on the ground fighting fire. They buzz us, which they should, probably should be turned to the FAA for what they're doing. Instead of coming in on the local comms, which we're on the local comms, and we're up on V-Fire, they can't come up on V-Fire. They can't come up on local comms. They have to brought, drop their King Air down on top of us to buzz us. And eventually, we'll get their frequency out of them. So it's not us that can't communicate, because we're communicating fine with ourselves. It, it's you guys. Here's the last thing I want to talk, I want to ask you about too. Do you really think it's a good idea for Texas to have their own Air Force? Yes, sir. I mean, I, mean, I mean, you see what you got sitting next I, to you. I do. It's the only way that, that we can be assured that we are going to be responsible and have responsibility for the operation. You, you don't think contractors would be, be better than your own? I think it's a combination of both. It's contractor until we have our own that we can operate and maintain. And, and then we have to make the decision, do we want additional contracts outside of the U.S. Forest Service contract? And this is something that I thought but I didn't say earlier. And uh, it, it will mean something to the members in the legislative process. The U.S. Forest Service holds the note until January of odd numbered years for what Texas spends on out of state firefighting assets. You get a supplemental request from the Texas Forest Service at the legislature to be funded around March or May, and that pays for the last two to two and a half years of aircraft that have been in Texas. So we're not using the Texas taxpayer dollars for almost two years to repay what we have used through U.S. Forest Service contracts, which is if, if we didn't do that, Every time I had those aircraft in the state, I would be paying for them to sit on the ground with current dollars today. So we are in the arrears to the U.S. Forest Service every biennium for, and it's been years when it's been 300, 400 million dollars that we have had to go back to the ledge and ask for that money to repay the U.S. Forest Service for their contract aircraft that they had in Texas. Well, all right, well, let me give you an example. This is on maybe Wednesday or Thursday after the fire. We've got multiple fires working. I'm dispatched to a fire south of town. I'll pull up on it, four services there, and multiple Canadian units are there, and multiple Wheeler units are there. It's maybe a five, 10 acre fire, but it's headed towards the house. And I'm flying around, fixing to start dropping water, and I get notified by the forest service, we've got air coming in. I'm saying, well, congratulations, I'm here. Well, they said, no, we got other air coming in. I'm like, no, you don't. Uh, I mean, in our airplanes, we, we got, it's called ABS, in and out. We can see airplanes. Right. I mean, they can be 50 miles away. We can freaking see them. We got radio communication. We know what their, what their secret frequencies are. We're calling them up. We can't communicate with them. I'm like, you don't have anything coming up soon. And uh, then uh, the, uh, the assistant fire chief says, we're good. I said, 10 that's all I need to know. We got another fire, and he, and he sent, dispatched me to another fire. Now, right before it burned that house up, about 45 minutes later, your, your air support showed up. I could have put the fire out, and the fire department's sitting there. It would have been about a 10-minute job, and we'd have this thing put out. Well, we, they sat around where the Forest Service held everybody off the fire while we're waiting for their air support to come in for 45 minutes. And how I know this, because I can hear them. I'm on the other fire. Me and another helicopter are fighting the other fire. They actually grounded us while they came in. They were 30 miles away, and they grounded us until we figured out why they are grounding us, and then we told them what to do with their grounding ideal. And that's when they popped the TFR up. So a TFR is a temporary flight restriction. Yes, sir. So when we're we're not in the national forest, right? No. We're private landowners. Yes. We got, we're out trying to find cows that need to be shot. We're trying to find cows that are dead. And you pop a TFR up on us. And we've had this conversation. That, that's, that's a big deal. You ground us. You keep us from fighting fire and working on our own ranches. And so that's when I ask you, are you sure 
you really want Texas to have their own Forest Service, uh, their own Forest Service slash Air Force. Because we've seen these guys in action. And it's kind of like, if they show up, if your house is on fire, let me tell you, you know this already, but let me tell you what's going to happen. Your house is on fire. The local fire department, the volunteer fire department is going to come put it out. Three days later, these guys are going to show up. And they're going to tell the news guys it's 0% zero zero percent contained until we knock all the neighbors' houses down. Once we doze all the neighbors' houses down, then we're at 100% contained. That's the way they work. And that's why I'm asking you for sure that you want Texas to be involved with these guys because they do not have a very good reputation. Uh, Chief Kidd, I'm going to respond to that for you for a moment. Um, I get your point, and not everybody, I think most people will agree with you in today's environment. We, we're hoping to change the hierarchy of who's in charge before this ever happens. So um, it, I, I, I do not intend on pumping billions of dollars into the same old system, is my point. Now, I think there's a way for well, it to get better. No, I, I do too. I'm just saying state ran. Right. It might not be our best avenue. Okay. Chairman Burroughs. I, I want to just have two, I think, pretty quick questions. Number one, and Ken alluded to this, but I don't know if you were able to answer it. Do you have a copy of the contract that you can provide this committee or get your attain it? I do not, but we will ask for it. Okay. Who are you going to ask for it? I'm going to start with the Forest Service, and then I'll go to FEMA to get it from the U.S. Forest Service. Okay. So I, I've asked for the emergency plan that's in writing that you can get us. You're going to see if you can get us the contract. And then just another question. How many aircraft would we actually have to purchase at the state of Texas to replace the number that we have contracted with to, at our peak season? How many aircraft are we talking about? Yeah, I would not purchase everything. I would have our own fleet to do the initial response. We would still have to bring in out-of-state resources. How I'm many, not looking at a total replacement. How many airplanes do we have on contract at the highest point, you know, during a year? Oh, 60. But that's not the number that we're looking at to buy. Okay. I want to make sure that we don't get that, – that's not the number that I think we should own. In, okay. in my mind, to have somewhere between four and six of our own firefighting aircraft that help us with our initial response when other contract aircraft are not available, I think is a great step going forward. Is, is there different classes of the 60 aircraft throughout the state as far as what functions and capabilities they have? Yes, sir. Are you able to give us, and I don't need it right now, but are you able to give us a breakdown of what the current kind of assets are that we have available to us at peak season so we know kind of what that current makeup is and the differentiation? It, as crazy as this sounds, I would not call where we are today peak season. I, I think we've got a lot of fire in front of us before the end of this year yeah. that we'll, we will get into I, peak I was suggesting today was that I just mean yeah. I, I want to know what is our top end. I mean, what, what, what is kind of at 60 aircraft you know, what does it look like, the fleet that we have available to us, and what do they do? Yes, sir. We can get that. I can tell you today, out of the 23 or so aircraft that we have, they'll have a breakdown of the V-LATs, the LATs, the seats, and any rotor wing that we have available. They'll be able to share you specifically what that is. But, but to answer the I, I want to be sure that we're not going down a path here that's unintended. I'm not asking the fire departments in this community or in this part of the state to have every fire truck that they need for their next fire nor am I saying we, the state, should own every aircraft we need for our next wildfire season. You think we need four to six? To start with. That fixed we have to rotary or what type of wing? At four fixed, two rotary, and some command aircraft to do air command. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Other questions, members, before we move on? Okay. Um, Chief Kidd, please stay, yes, stay put. All right. Chair calls Al Davis. Just uh, for the record, um, oh, she rep um, you're representing Texas A&M Forest Service. Is yes, sir, I am. Oh, cheers, McCain. And thank you very much, uh, first of all, for the opportunity to come and speak to the committee today. And then first, let me express my empathy for all who were impacted with this last fire. 
All right, and uh, we have also our folks who are on that fire, uh, like the locals and VFDs who are impacted. My empathy goes to them also. Uh, let me, because I'm not familiar with some of the folk who may not be familiar with me, let me just, if I may, Mr. Chairman, uh, give a little bit of my background here. I'm a retired Marine, 27 years, served in the infantry, uh, logistics, recruiting, entry-level training. I commanded OCS, uh, and I also served on the Joint Staff at the Pentagon, uh, J-7 interoperability as a division chief. And that last thing there uh, makes it easier for me to work with Chief Kidd and the other agencies that do emergency response. Also, as a young captain, uh, we had to deploy some of my Marines as a company commander with E-2s to fight fires in California. Uh, so again, uh, that's my background militarily. Uh, I've been, before taking over this job, almost three years, one June, I was with Teeks for 16 years. Uh, was on the Commission to Rebuild Texas. Uh, I did different programmatic things, but was director of the National Emergency and Response and Rescue Training Center, uh, the deputy agency director and chief operations officer, and chairman of the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium. And as a reminder, Teeks, uh, when I was chief operations officer, I had uh, over. in really immersing myself in no matter what I do, this job and other jobs, uh, got, did some structural firefighting and training and indoctrination at Teak. So I understand the discomfort and the safety and the danger that's inherent to those types of things. Uh, I'd like to say, uh, again, I'm going to be followed by my fire chief who will get down to specifics on the uh, basic, uh, the specifics of the panhandle, but a lot of the things that we've been doing, I think, relate to a couple three of the three areas that we're going to be discussing here today. First of all, in addition to our role uh, as a state's emergency response all hazards component, we also have three core mission areas that deal with conservation, uh, pro uh, protection, that's fire, and other things, and leadership. And under that leadership is capacity building, okay, giving equipment grants and what have you, and working with homeowner associations and individual landowners on right and best management practice plans and what have you. We have 540 personnel located in 59 locations to include College Station, about 315 or wildland firefighters who also, who also do conservation. Among my priorities as agency director are safety, retention, and recruiting, and relationships. And that retention and recruiting is very, very important because we need to keep people to make sure that they traverse through those different positions in the agency to replace people who are retiring. Because like any other organization, we have people who decide to go elsewhere or people who are retiring. So that's why this retention thing is extremely important here. Uh, some highlights of the actions we've taken uh, since I came on board almost three years ago and Chief Moorhead and I, he took his position a little bit before me, uh, before I got there, before I was asked to do this, is first of all, uh, organizational modification of fuel operations to we now have them all reporting to Chief Kidd, which is called unity of command. Basically, instead of two different people at the agency level controlling the field operations, it now becomes under him. Under the 88th legislative session outcomes, we got more positions to put more boots on the ground. Not only boots on the ground, but to also have aviation support sections, people that are trained. One of the first things I did uh, when I got into this job is I went around, uh, we were in, I believe, Abilene, and the federal folks were, were actually doing the mixing of the uh, retardant and running the airplanes and what have you, and we lost the two, two of the three people we had to the feds. So I said, we need to have our own people trained, so that's one of the things we're doing. And by the way, I visited all 58 of our locations out in the field. Sir, Mr. Abraham, I haven't had a chance to meet you, but I did go out to meet Mr. Frank Price, and I learned very quickly that West Texas ain't East Texas or South Texas. And what we call fuel reduction 
in East Texas is not the same in West Texas in the Panhandle. So I want to get a chance to meet you, sir, and to really find out what your issues are to make sure, just as we want to serve all the citizens of the state of Texas, that we're meeting your expect expectations where we can work together. And that's because relationships are extremely important to us, and we can't do it alone. In addition to that, we opened up red card certification to TIFMAS people. Prior to our arrival, it wasn't done. But we can't fight fires all by ourselves. In an in a, a, uh, example I use, I was an infantry officer, and I had another buddy, uh, Al Anderson, and I'm Al Davis. He was infantry. Uh, he had gold wings on his chest and some scuba wings, and that meant he jumped out perfectly with working airplanes, and he held his breath underwater 10 seconds longer than me. But at the same time, we were Marines infantry marines and we feel the same way about our locals and VFD firefighters here so that's why we open up the red card process to them because we we increase the capability to putting people on the ground doing that firefighting there uh, also we actively uh, support uh, uh, pursued former structural firefighters to come into our our organization. We have one at TDM who helps to manage the, pro, uh, the TIFMAS program and one other. Uh, when I came on this job, I met with a couple of old timers who are no longer with us, and I asked about, hey, just give me the, the history of where we've been and where I want to go. And one of the takeaways I got there uh, from a gent, Paul, uh, Paul Hahnemann, okay, said, you got to have a diversity of experiences there. And I took that to heart. So we're trying to do that. Uh, some other things that we've done, and this is important for retention. When I got here, our resource specialists, and I called them the grunts of the Texas a and Forest Service. They're the people who are doing the hands crews and the strike teams and what have you were making $13 an hour because of the generosity of the 88th legislature, and we really appreciate that, we were able to raise their pay to $19 an hour. And then one September, it goes to $21 an hour. Why is that important? Uh, because we need to retain those people so we're not having a turnover of personnel and trying to retrain people again. And the more we keep people in place and get to know our citizens and what the challenges are, the better we do. Okay, other than that, uh, we considered experiences versus degree, operational experiences. We were losing some people because we said you needed to have a degree to be a regional coordinator or what have you. We look at experience there, so that's helped us also. And we have some people coming back to the agency with a lot of experience because we did those couple things there. Okay? We've also done a leadership development program. We, uh, you heard me say out in the field we have 58 officers. Of, of course, the headquarters being 59. And I always say we can't control everything that goes out around the state of Texas in the 254 counties in 58 offices, but we don't sure better be influencing it. So again, we are doing leadership development and leadership training so we don't have the issues that we're talking about there. And one of the big things that we did was the core values card that we give our folks when they check on the board there at our new employer orientation, and our leaders have signed up to a leadership pledge. And that's very important. Again, that's the Marine in me. I mean, again, commanding officer candidate school and, and uh, entry-level training for officers and hitting recruiting, all those things are important. We just don't want to have a revolving door where we have to always get people inculcated into our core values and that we're about selfless service here. And I'm going to be wrapping up here in a minute here. Uh, again, regarding relationships, we have the locals, the VFDs, the Southern Group of State Foresters, the National Association of, of State Foresters, National Wildfire Coalition uh, Group, here Region 8 of the U.S. Forest Service, uh, TCFP, TIFMAS, and the Texas Military Department. So again, I'm going to defer after any questions you would have to me, but I wanted to just first of all uh, let you know about me, my background, and why I was asked to do this, and what we believe is important as we serve the state and the citizens of Texas. And first of all, safety, uh, retention and recruiting, and relationships among our uh, parties there, and we have empathy for the community, empathy for this community. Sir, that concludes my remarks. Chairman King, and uh, I'll open myself up for any questions before I turn it over to my fire chief. Um, thank you, Mr. Davis, and thank you for your service. Um, Chairman Hunter. 
All right, so you're the head guy. Yes, sir. The buck stops with you, right? Yes, sir, that is correct. Where do you live now? I live in Bryan, Texas, sir. I have an apartment there. I okay. have a home in New Orleans, but I have a, a uh, okay, apartment. Okay, you're, you're in Aggieville, right? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. So how many head guy do you have in the panhandle from your agency? We have right now about the uh, rest of my, about 20, about 36. 36 people, excuse me, 36, 36 people. 36 people yes. live here. Yes, sir, in the panhandle. All right. You rely on them for an incident like this? Yes, sir. And others. Yes, sir. Now, do you agree with Chief Kidd on having a Texas Air Force? I think that's a great addition, sir, to what we have now. And what we have now, we also use federal contracts that come in. We do, I do agree with Chief Kidd that we need our own airplanes. And I think until we get our own, it's a combination of also looking at contracting aircraft. So the answer is yes. Yes, sir, it is. And you agree that we need four to six operational planes? Yes, sir, we've discussed this. What type of planes? Uh, sir, it depends. I think it needs to be airplanes that have capacity to carry more gallons of retardant where we're not coming back and forth that are doing certain things and also we have 12 aviation bases but we have to consider to the aviation bases that are set up right here now okay based upon what type of planes it should be so probably large air tankers and are they only used for fires i would i would think so sir no I mean, other they contribute they contribute they are right now those that we would get would have to be configured for that but at the end of the day that we all hazards incident management i think fire should be the priority so we're clear when we make the recommendation so the planes are only for fires nothing else as i sit here right now sir we're going through draft of doing the lars i think i would get with my fire chief and with chief kid on what we would determine to be the use of those aircraft so you're not 100% yet? That is correct, sir. Okay. Now, I've been hearing all these words, you know, FEMA, TEKS, sounds like a bunch of viruses to me. So we got a bunch of audio. We got people listening in. One thing I'd ask the panelists, people like the public may not know what a TEK is or things like that. So when we talk about it, try to make sure that uh, people uh, understand what we're talking about. And I know I'm a little gray on my view of FEMA. So you've been with Texas Forest Service for three years, right? Yes, sir. In one June would be three years, sir. What other requests do you have of the legislature? Right now, sir, I would think we're looking at our legislative draft right now, legislative appropriation request draft. I would say, uh, other than the airplanes, I would say also money to contract aircraft we're looking at right now. And then perhaps going back and trying to uh, get a appropriations on the things that we didn't get in the last session. And one of those things could be to try to uh, buy down the unfunded request of vehicles to VFDs right now. Okay, and since you're the head guy, did you bring the contract? The contract for the aircraft, sir? Yeah. No, sir, I don't have that because that's done by Region 8 of the U.S. Forest Service. But I didn't of make the U.S., that. so we're back to the U.S. group. Yes, sir. Does the state group not get a copy? We do not, sir. We do not have a copy, but that's easy to access. So is it so easy we could get it today? I think we'd like to take a look at it. We'll make a call, sir, to see if we can get that, sir. It's 9.45 a.m. Central Time. Why don't, if you all could, kind of text somebody or see if we can say, how long is this contract? Is this a short contract, a long contract, or do you know? I do not know, sir. Oh, you don't know? Yeah. So who in the Forest Service knows about this contract? 
My oh, we're, here, get, we're getting ready. <laughs> yes, your, sir. your hurts, we're going to Avis here in a second, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes, sir. Okay, so we'll ask him the contract questions. You don't know anything about that other than the miraculous contract is there. Or do you know that? Well, sir, if I may clarify here, uh, we get our airplanes resourced through Regenerate of the U.S. Forest Service, whom we have a relationship with uh, there, okay? Uh, we're going to try to get a copy of their contract to see how long it's for and what have you. I will also say, if I may add, the issue of the availability of aircrafts, I'm also on the Wildland Fire Committee for the National Association of State Foresters, was discussed in our last meeting on moving that up and not basing it just on California. So this issue is one that is also germane to my counterparts in other parts of may, the United may States. What, what does California have to do with this? The conversation we had, sir, in the meeting is that the contracts and the aircraft should be available earlier than just basing it on the California wildfire season. Okay, well, that will be a topic for some more questions. But right now, you all make that request for the contract. Now, I'm assuming it may have some other paragraphs about some other issues that the public may want to know about. Don't you agree? I agree about okay. that. Okay. So if you all do this, and I'm sure you'll be hanging around with us, won't you? Yes, sir. I'll be here for at least you know, two days. I'll be, I'll be here three days. Uh, Chairman, I'll be checking with you on the... Yeah. the discovery of the contract. When we have that contract in-house, we will redirect re re um, Director Davis or, or Fire, Fire Chief. Thank you very much, Chairman. Other questions? Mr. Abraham. Hey, Al. So here, here's the... I mean, you heard some of the stuff I, I was... I was talking about, but here's one. I want to kind of change subjects for your ground crew. I want to set the scene for you. So here's the scene. We've been, we've been fighting fire, and I'm talking the volunteer fire department. Most of them have been up for 48 hours. And you guys kind of come rolling in with your fancy <laughs> trucks. But the problem is, you don't work, you don't fall in with our guys. You, you do your own deal. It's, like, it's kind of like you're kind of like unwanted family that shows up, and now we got to feed you and take care of you. And you got some good ideals for us, but we've been here for two freaking days, and we were here 365 days before that. We know the landowners. We know the we know the roads. We know the pastures. We know the landowners. You guys show up, and you don't help. You do your own thing. And the only thing, only way we know that you're actually there is because I might be in the helicopter 20 miles away on the head fire helping the volunteers shut the fire down. Mm -hmm. And we get a call from y'all because your backfire got away from you and I got to fly 20 miles back to put your backfire out. Right? That's the problem that we see with the ground crew. We need what we need, or what the volunteer fire department is, they need a little relief. When you guys show up, they need to be able to take a nap. Maybe drink a little bit of water and have a sandwich. They've been eating smoke for 48 hours straight. And then, and then, and then the, the unwanted cousins show up, and you're absolutely no help. Does that make sense? That's, that's what we see from y'all. And that's a big disappointment. And also what we don't see from y'all is help with training. And when we do train, they have to pay for their own tests. They have to pay for their own certif certification. They turn in, they're driving 30, 40-year-old trucks. They, they've had applications in for new trucks for over 10 years. Grants in for new trucks. Nothing. Everybody else is getting them. We're not getting them. We, we got the biggest grass fires. I mean, we might have the record now. It's because we broke our old record, right? So, so what's the problem at the Forest Service? And I know, 
So here's here's the deal we get in with the Forest Service. It's kind of, and, I, and we've had this conversation, it's like Groundhog's Day. I've had this conversation over and over and over because you guys don't stay in your seats very long. I mean, I'm waiting for one of y'all to quit and get up and leave because you've been here three years. That's like a record. I've never seen anybody be here for three years. And, it, and we had a conversation in Hemphill County just the other day, or I guess it was about six, seven months ago, and we made it very clear, say, we don't want you dozers in our county. The very next fire, two months later, what do you think shows up? Your dozers. Well, the guys that were in charge are no longer there. We've solved this, we've solved this problem multiple times. But what happens, apparently you don't have a chalkboard you can write this down on. You go back to the same SOP, and it doesn't work. And, we, and, and then we got a new guy. And then we solve the problem. It lasts six months. Then you're gone. So how can we solve the problem? Well, thanks, Joe. First of all, thank you, and I appreciate your comments. And one thing that I will commit to, because this is our first time communicating, that myself and my fire chief will come and visit with you and be all ears on seeing how we can address those things that you've mentioned. Yeah, no, no, I believe you. And, 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 and I think we'd have a great conversation. We can hang out and do all. But the problem is the next guy in line, it, doesn't, it never gets passed on, yeah. right? We, we, need, we need firefighters. We don't need fire managers. We need guys when, 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 when you show up, believe me, we're tired. You're not going to show up when we're fresh. And then you guys, well, so one example. Two years ago, I had a fire on, on my ranch. You guys show up with your dozers. I tried to run you off multiple times. It cost Hemphill County $260,000 to come back and fix your dozer messes. That's $260,000 that Hemphill County didn't have budgeted to spend. And we've had this discussion multiple times. And the new guy didn't get the memo, right? How can we solve the problem? How can we how can we write this down in stone and maybe well, we don't have to just keep coming back and having Groundhog Day over and over mm -hmm. and over? And how can we have some firefighters that come up and fight fire and not manage or have a safety meeting or hold us off of a fire mm -hmm. or what we'll get out go we'll get out there with their little rakes and rake a little little grass around or run me off the fire? Run all of us, all us local guys get run off the fire. I mean, we have five helicopters sitting there fighting fire, and we get run off the fire because we've got assets coming in. And when you pop a TFR, there's not much we can do. Correct. Yes, sir. We'll visit with you, and Chief and I will listen to your... Well, I mean, you do. I want to hear it now. I want to hear something now. I want to hear... Yes, sir. Again... Uh, we always analyze and assess on what's going on. Uh, one of the things we've done recently, as I said, and this was back in November, is for us field operations being under one individual. Right, sir? And so what we'll do, we'll come sit with you, and we'll come up with some recommendations to address this problem. Uh, I mean, uh, man, that's what the last guy said, and the guy before that, and the guy before that. And I've been doing this for 20 freaking years. Yeah flying around, watching you guys do your thing. And the guy before that told me the same thing you're telling me. So, well, so well, don't get excited when I'm not too excited to talk to hear, you, hear your stuff again. I understand, sir, and what I would ask is give us an opportunity, this guy and this guy. That's what the well, last guy said. Well, well, I understand, sir, but give this guy an opportunity along with my fire chief to address your issues. It's not my issues. It's our issues. I understand. Yes, sir. We, we all, it, and my issue is the last issue in the world. What, what I want to see, I'm, I'm in the air, and I'm watching all these guys eat smoke all day long. I'm not, it, I've got, I usually got air conditioner going, maybe some music playing. I'm pretty comfortable. But when I'm watching these guys, I've been in their spot. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've been on the fire truck, and I've been in their spots. 
And I know how hard they are, how hard it is. And I know how bad their head probably hurts from being dehydrated and eating smoke all day. And then not to have the relief. I mean, when we call somebody, we'd like to have some relief. So what I, I guess what I'm saying is if you're not, if you, if y'all aren't capable of relieving these guys and helping them or falling in with them or getting in a fire truck and helping them or do anything, maybe you should find somebody that is. Yeah. And maybe they're not, maybe they don't have the check by their name. Maybe they didn't pass the test. Yeah. But by God, they know how to get on the front of a fire truck and squirt a hose. Yeah. Right? I'm just sick of, I'm just sick of beating this dead horse. Yeah. Is what I'm sick of. Maybe, uh, Director, uh, maybe these 36 Panhandle Texas Forest Service employees should do a little of their own training with the volunteer fire departments maybe embed and learn what what these guys are going through and the lack of equipment they have possibly with the efforts we've made on retention recruitment and higher pay and, we're, and i get all that that was the reason we appropriated that money yes. possibly we're going to keep them longer than three years but if they act instead of instead of talking about how our volunteers don't have enough training how about some hands-on training by your 36 employees that live here in the Panhandle, where they can actually talk to our fire chief on their on the same level, and they know when they say, "Hey, we're out on Quarter Horse Road or South River Road or whatever or Mendota," somebody from the Forest Service knows what the hell we're talking about. I think that'd be a great first step. I mean, just a just a thought. Members, other questions? Uh, Director Robert. Davis. Um, oh. You've heard a little bit about your reputation. Um, being an Aggie up here, anything that's associated with Texas A&M and has that kind of reputation, I'm pretty disappointed. But I'll tell you, as a landowner and, and a rancher in the Texas Panhandle, um, the instructions to our guys on the ranch is please don't ever call the Forest Service. We've asked the local fire departments. We've asked the county judge. Please don't. We have our own firefighting equipment. When we have fires, we expect to do it ourselves with the help of the volunteer fire departments. But I, I don't need the damage that's done from the Forest Service when they come in because it's damage enough having a fire. Uh, when, when you're as destructive as the Forest Service is when they come on the property, I don't need that in addition because there's plenty going on. One of the things that I think is probably a tremendous problem, and, and Jason addressed it a little bit, but I want to address it a little bit further, is the amount of turnover that, that happens. If these fires happen every five or six years, there's nobody that shows up here that's fought one of these fires before because they're all gone. And so is $19 an hour or $21 an hour compared to other firefighting forces that that somebody can be part of does that kind of money compare does that stop the the turnover what what's necessary from your standpoint from a competitive point of view what do we need to be paying members of the texas a&m forest service to keep them yes sir first of all sir thank you for that those comments and and like you i would say uh and i mr abraham mentioned also we're going to look at, take a serious look at that issue, sir, of us not being uh, valued as a partner here in the panhandle. I will say so, uh, and I say this deferentially and respectfully, that is not the same impression that other citizens have in other parts of Texas, and I understand that's not your concern. I understand that, sir. Uh, I will tell you on the salaries, before we were at 19, uh, we know the feds make less than that, so we're making more than the feds right now. And the feedback we're getting from what we've done with pay has been pretty positive. And the fact that some people are coming back to us is a good, good barometer also. You heard me mention about some leadership things. That's important also, those things. So there's not just a one silver bullet, sir, to uh, stem attrition and the enhanced retention, it's a combination of things, and those are some of the things that myself and Chief Moorhead have put in place 
to stem that. And the feedback we're getting is pretty good, sir. Done? Yeah, Chairman Burroughs. Okay, I have a few questions for you, Director. Um, I want to talk about the other written document other than the contract. We have, you guys have a plan, right? Written plan for a wildfire that breaks out. Is that yes, fair? Sir. Yes, sir. Incident action plans. Yes, All right, sir. we're going to get a copy of that, but I imagine that the work really starts on a wildfire situation before the fire even begins. Is that fair? That is correct. Yes, that sir. you have somebody who's monitoring the conditions to see if they exist such that we may have an increased risk. Is that fair? That is fair. Who has the, is it meteorologists or who is it that actually monitors the conditions to make sure that we're watching everything to see if wildfires could break out? Yes, sir. Well, first, sir, we have a predictive analysis department in our agency and we will also work with the National Weather Service. In the comments that my fire chief has, he was going to delve a little bit more into that. But okay. basically, those are the type of things that we have. How many on. people are in the predictive analysis department? Yes, would you? Uh, currently 11 people. 11 people. All right. But they, but they, are, they are in your agency, and they are doing predictive analysis to see if the conditions might exist such that we have a fire like the one that broke out here, or fires. Is that fair? That is correct. Yes, all right, and they're, and, they're, and they're monitoring weather conditions and drought and all sorts of things to get there. Is that right? That is correct. All right. When is it, was it February 19th was the first time your predictive analysis department said, hey, the conditions are such that there may be an issue? Yeah, take that question. Yeah. Yes, you know, um, one second. We have not recognized. Okay. I'm sorry. We have not recognized Mr. Understand. Moorhead yet, so answer the question or pass and we will address it again when he comes back. Yes, sir. Thank I'd you. like to pass that if I may, sir, when, uh, okay, right. if that's when okay. We, when right. we will ask that question, or Chairman Burroughs will ask yes. that question again in a moment when we recognize Mr. Moorhead, but for you, okay. I'll, I'll ask it differently so that we don't run afoul of the rule yes. of recognition here. So my understanding is at some point in time, whether it was February 19th or another date, your, your predictive analysis department said, hey, wait a second, you know, we've got a red flag out there that says there could be an issue. Is that right? Well, sir, what happened for this fire, there was no recognition of it was a new phenomenon, which we got from the National Weather Service and our predictive analysis, that we staged the equipment based upon what we got in the forecast. A new phenomenon. What, what, what is the new phenomenon? Meaning that we, there's something called the Southern Plains wildfire outbreak that we deal with with Kansas and Oklahoma and Texas. It was not predicted to be that. Okay, but so, this was similar once we, after this right, happened. So, so, our, so our predictive analyses people didn't really catch this because it was a new phenomenon? Not only our predictive analysis, Everybody's. Sir, but those in Kansas and Oklahoma, the same. Yes, sir. I, I assume there's some sort of algorithm or math problem that's set up to identify these issues, and we had a wrong variable or weren't watching it. Uh, sir, I'm not a weather person, but I will tell you that there are a number of things that we look at okay. to do to actually stage and know what the prediction and forecast are within our agency and with the National Weather Service. Okay, but at some point in time, somebody, whether it was your predictive analysis department or National Weather Service said, wait a second, conditions are there, therefore a red flag. Yes, sir, but okay. not to the extent, if, if I would put something in the briefings and I go to the briefings, uh, we got was on the scale of one to 10, it was somewhere around a five or six. Okay, so we, at some point in time on Sunday, I'm gonna get the question yes. next, we had, all of a sudden it flashed up five or six out of ten. That's the, that's the alert, right? That is correct. Is that how it's measured, one through ten? Is that the scale? Well, on, on the scale, using that as an example. But, but what, is, what is the scale you all use? We, sir, we use a number of indicators and indices for predictions, but from layman's language, it was on the scale of, of a scale of one to ten, about a five or six in the last briefing that I went through. Okay, but, that, but that's actually the numerical numbers that, if, that existed, that would exist, right? Not that actually existed, but it's a scale of one to ten that you say, okay, we're at a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is correct. All right, and at some point in time on Sunday, we're about to find out, it triggered an alert that there was a five or six. That is correct. 
All right, and whenever that happens, that's before the fire's actually started, correct? That is correct. That's before the ignition, correct? That's correct. All right, so at that point in time, is it your agency that is responsible to take a survey of what equipment and personnel are available, what staging needs to occur? That is correct, sir. Right. That's how we do pre-positioning and pre-staging. Do yes. you, or is it your agency's responsibility to reach out to all of the people and personnel that would have equipment or personnel to make sure they are staged and ready to go to address it in case a fire breaks out? Yes, it is. How do y'all do that? And we work with TDM and we work with TIFMAS and other resources also on what we need to stage for a fire. Okay, I, I understand. Is it like a Zoom call? Is it a phone call? Is it a everybody get together? You can't all huddle because you're in different areas, right? How, how is that done? So we do that through an operations call. And again, I would, if I may, I would like to, because I don't want to uh, confuse anybody or misspeak, but those are the things we have in my fire chief's comments. But we do have a protocol where we do ops calls on a daily basis regarding fire conditions, weather, and what have you. Every day or just when certain numericals achieved by the predictive analysis This department? is a daily type of occurrence, sir. So every day, every single day of the year, there is an ops call? There's some type of ops call in when we have the heightened fire season, yes. Are you on those calls? Yes, on most calls I am. Yes. Who else is on those calls? The fire chief, our folks out in the field, our regional coordinators, our TIFMAS coordinators, and what have you. So we have a bevy of people, a number of people on those calls. How long do those calls last? Depends. Some may take an hour. Some may be 30 minutes or 45 minutes. We do also uh, TDM calls on the TDM SOC calls, state operations centers calls. I assume and that the calls are shorter if we have a one next to the predictive analysis and they get a little longer when there's a five or six or seven or eight. P perhaps, perhaps, uh, yes. Do we have any local officials that are on any of those calls? We have a number of cooperators. I don't have a list of all, but I would, I would say yes. At some point in time when the conditions exist in the panhandle, do we get local regional people on that call before the fires actually broke out? I, I can't, I don't know the answer to that question, sir. I would, if I may, okay. defer it to either uh, Chief Chair. I'll, I'll get or, there. Yeah. Here's, here's the question I have. During the phone calls that existed leading up to this weather, this event, this fire event, was there any conversation or discussion about the airplanes not being available before the fires broke out? because of whatever conditions, because California wasn't having wildfires, therefore we didn't have our federal assets or federal airplanes in place? Sir, I don't recall a conversation on what wasn't available because of California. When the calls happen, then we do pre-positioning and talk about pre-positioning on what we expect at that time. Did you know before the fires, during those phone calls, was it discussed we did not have the airplanes we would need to fight the fires? I, I can't answer that question. I don't recall the answer to that question. You don't remember if that I don't, was... I don't, I don't remember that. Do you know if the phone calls to get supplemental aircraft was made before or after the fires broke out, or do you know? Okay, sir, I do not know because I don't make those phone calls. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Chairman Hunter. Just real quick, Texas Forestry Service, do you do anything in South Texas? Yes, sir, we do. Yes. What forests are in South Texas? When you say forest in South Texas, sir, I mean, the name of the agency is, is the Texas Forest Service, Texas well, State Forest Service. I've listened to all the folks, and I'm kind of confused that we have the Texas Forestry Service handling a West Texas fire, and you need the four to six planes for the Texas Forestry Service. Where are the forests? Why is this agency the one that's being assigned out here? Or do we need a name change? Are you asking my opinion, sir? Well, you're the only one testifying. I don't think there needs to be a name change. Don't, don't worry sir. about it. You've got two people trying to raise their hands. I, I, no, sir, but I, I, and, I'm, uh, I'm going by Chairman Kings. I'm, 
I'm on the dime here, and he has not recognized anybody else, respectfully, sir. And that's why I was trying well, to... I'm, all I want to know is, do you know why the Texas Forestry Service is assigned to the wildfires in the Panhandle in West Texas? And I still want to know where the forests are in South Texas that you tell me you're handling. Well, it's... Because there's a lot of beach with no trees, maybe the palm trees. That's correct, yes, sir. So, do you know the origin? Well, sir, we in legislation since 19... We've been around since 1915, again, and we work in a lot of areas also. I got you. Chairman, you know, one thing we might think of is, because you've made a good point, you and Chairman Burroughs and the other members, on what needs to happen here. One of the things is we may need to look at the jurisdiction of the agency and the name, because it's probably confusing to a lot of folks why the wildfires are being handled by a forestry service, and if there were any forests, I'm sure they're gone. So that may be something we need to look in the legislative recommendations. I agree. Thank you. I agree. Mem members, other questions? I one second, Chief Kidd. I'm going to come back to you. Um, Director, I want to, um, you mentioned red card training. Can you explain that? Yes, that red card training uh, is training that's done with the National Wildfire Coordination Group where there are certain things and uh, uh, objectives and capabilities that a person needs to have to be assigned to certain types of fires to do certain things and what have you. And that's why it's called red carding. Okay. And it's if somebody comes like an incident management, if someone comes to an incident and you want them to be in logistics, or operations, or public affairs, we know what training you have, so we don't have to brief you or try to train you up on that as that incident is occurring. And are you saying this red card training is and it's administered to the Texas Forester Service? Yes. Yes. Okay. We and do, it yes. is open now to. We're opening it up now, but it just used to be our agency. Now we have opened it up. And the Forest up. Service, uh, according to previous testimony I heard, I, it's, is it my understanding that the Forest Service would pay for the, you know, the trainer, but for a, a volunteer firefighter to come to that training, that money would not be available from, from the agency? Well, we have uh, training money in the 2604 training funds for that. Okay. But we don't, but as was stated here, that we don't pay for a person's uh, salary that they would have to leave or expenses or what have you, but there are some things we pay. There are for, some things that get paid for for a volunteer paid. fire department. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. Um, and, we're, and probably uh, this will go to your fire chief because I've got more questions about 2604 for sure. Um, one of the things you said, and I just, I just want to clear, clear it up, um, and, and, and I don't know how many times you've testified, but things you say always come back to haunt you. And the new phenomenon statement is really haunting me right now because I know for a fact three of the last major fires that came through here went on the exact same track. In fact, the 17 fire was a million acre fire as well, except the cold front that always sets up on the other end of it didn't hit till Kansas. So. I don't see the new phenomenon here. I mean, that's kind of the point of the hearing that is, you know, since 06, I've been going through wildfires up yeah. here, and they all pretty much follow the burn up the river and go north till the cold front hits and it blows back over the top of it. So I take a little exception with new phenomenon because if it was a new phenomenon, we wouldn't have a hearing. I mean, we, I mean, in 06, we probably should have addressed this, or the legislature then should have addressed this in a meaningful way back then. But it's not a new phenomenon. This happens over and over and over. And so, I, after your explanation, I know what you mean on the technicality of the number and all that, but to everybody sitting there hearing this, when they heard new phenomenon, they're every, every eye in the place opened wide like, really? This is not a new phenomenon. So I would just caution you in your testimony to, to be careful of, of those kind of statements that, can, that tend to confuse what we're what we're trying to accomplish here um one of the things that has disturbed me already um from 
the, the testimony we've already heard, and I expect this is going to only get worse. Uh, now I know why nobody told the local officials that we weren't going to have airplanes because nobody in the state had a copy of the contract. You didn't know we weren't going to have airplanes. And which, hence the, where we started with this, because whether the state owns the aircraft or we rename the Texas Forest Service or whoever manages it, we never want to be in a position again that the state of Texas is dependent on a federal government that didn't share the damn paperwork work with us. We can't do that anymore. So I know now why um, my county judges were not told up front that there was no aircraft available because the Texas Forestry Service doesn't have a copy of the contract and you didn't know it either. So that answers that question. Members, is there other questions for the director before we move on? Okay, thank you, Director. Please stay put. There may be some follow-up questions for you. Before we recognize our next witness, I'm going to go back to Chief Kidd. He's been dancing. He either needs to go potty or he's got something to say. Chapter 88 of the Education Code assigns statewide firefighting to the Texas Forest Service. Okay. That's to answer Chairman Hunter's question. They've been the Texas Forest Service since 1915, and over the years we have used their resources and expertise to uh, expand to an all-hazards footprint. There are four service employees assigned in the coastal bend area. During hurricane season, they help us set up points of distribution. They help us open shelters. They help us do with incident management teams. So while the name says Texas Forest Service, they are a statewide organization that does statewide emergency response. So um, Chief Kidd, it, it appears to me though and I know we still have a lot of testimony left to get to, and, and, and my opinion may change. But how many, how many um, agencies did you say, refresh my memory, at the first year testimony are now under the banner of A&M? Eight. 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 And they agencies. all act independently of each other, correct? They have their own director. They have their own funding. They, they're not one agency from the top down. Is that correct? That, that is correct on most daily basis. So just like the Department of Public Safety has a Public Safety Commission, each of our agencies answers to the Board of Regents. So we have one organization in the a and University system with agencies underneath it. You would see HHSC saw this, you saw this in years past where we decided, legislature decided to put them together and then decided to pull them apart and then put them back together. So it is each individual funding patterns, each individual agencies nested under the land-grant university. So the money would flow from the legislature to the, to the land-grant university and the Board of Regents then disperses the funds to the various agencies. You put that money in each of our agencies, the Board blesses our operation. Gotcha. Thank you. Mr. Hunt. Just to remind everybody that's listening, this is an investigative committee, and so we ask these questions because we have to do a report, and it's not what a regular committee does, we're investigating. So I just want everybody to know some of these questions may be because we have to develop a report. But the one thing we started with Chairman King, and I think Jason had met it too, Mr. Abraham, is communication. What has bothered me through catastrophes since I've been in, since 1989, half the room wasn't even born, is it'd be good to know who's in our area. I come in and I hear about all these agencies and all the things they do, Chairman King and Chairman Burroughs, I've never seen them. Now we, and I want to send this message to all of you, we fund you. If we don't hear from you, why should we fund you? So if you've got a forestry group down there, I'd sure like to know who the heck they are. I'm going to go tell my staff to go find out where the palm tree forests are in South Texas. <laughs> but my point is, I've learned there's a communication issue. Whether it's the fire issue, the storm issue. But if these agencies are in our areas, you have three state representatives. You have two public members. We need to know who they are. And remember, my view is, if you don't need our funding, don't talk to us. 
That's my view. If you don't need to talk to us, then you don't need to be funded. But send the message back to all the agencies that if we're state representatives, we're state senators, they need to visit with us. We don't need to hear about it after the catastrophe takes place. And I will tell you, as you know, Chief Kid, that's why I called Blair out, because you assigned her, and she talks to us. But what really frustrates me is we have a catastrophe, and I haven't even heard from agencies. Some of them I didn't know were named for us, and they're in charge of the fire. So bottom line is communication, Chairman, you were right on. Mr. Abraham, you were right on. This is something we do need to improve in the legislative process. Thank you. Members, other questions? For Mr. Davis or Chief Kip for removal. Seeing none, let's uh Okay. All right. Chair calls Wes Moorhead. Uh, uh Mr. Moorhead, I show that you represent Texas AM Force Service and you are the fire chief. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman King, and thank you, committee members, for taking the time to investigate the Panhandle wildfires. My name is Wes Moorhead. I'm Associate Director and Fire Chief for the Texas Forest Service. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you today to answer your questions and ultimately work with you to improve our state's wildfire response. I have some prepared opening statements I'd like to share for the record. First, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the profound impact these wildfires have had on the communities of this region, on the livelihood of the folks that reside and work in this area, and to acknowledge the loss of life. These fires were devastating, and we do grieve alongside you. In recent years, we've observed, observed a growing trend in the magnitude and the intensity of wildfires across the state of Texas, the impacts of which are widespread and affect communities for years after the fires are gone. In 2022, one of the most significant fire years, uh, 2022 was one of the most significant fire years that the state of Texas has experienced since 2011. And just last summer, the state experienced its worst summer fire season yet. I began working for the Forest Service 23 years ago as a forester and a firefighter. Over my career, I have responded to and led the response to several large and destructive wildfires. The wildfires that occurred in February, however, were truly unprecedented and absolutely unlike anything we have ever seen or experienced in the state before. One of the tools we use in managing wildfires is fire forecasting. This technology provides increasingly sophisticated data on weather patterns and ground conditions to help us make smart choices for operational management of and strategic planning for wildland firefighting assets, such as firefighters, heavy equipment, engines, and aircraft. The science that backs these predictions up is new and emerging, and it continues to evolve as the, as the fire environment changes. Leading up to February 26, there were few signs to indicate that a wildfire of this magnitude would occur in this area. The gradual increase in wildfire activity that typically occurs over a two to three week period before an outbreak event did not happen. In fact, local and state firefighters had only responded to 18 wildfires across the entire panhandle prior to February 26 this year. Conditions that were forecast for February 26 did not match the typical pattern of a wildfire outbreak. While elevated fire danger was forecast to impact the panhandle, ample cloud cover, which is typically a mitigating factor for large wildfire occurrence, was also forecast. The agency positioned personnel and equipment at four service offices in the region in anticipation of these forecast conditions and were ready to respond to any request for assistance from local jurisdictions. In Texas, helping each other is what we do. The Forest Service, which has only 300 firefighters for the entire state, has a long history of supporting fire departments and has been committed to helping enhance their emergency response capabilities for decades. Local firefighters are the state's first line of defense when it comes to wildfire response. They respond to every single wildfire call and they do not require state assistance the majority of the time. In fact, nine out of 10 wildfires in the state are fought locally. If a wildfire becomes complex and requires specialized equipment or additional personnel, the local jurisdiction can call the state to assist. The state of Texas invests significant authority for public safety and emergency response with counties and local government. The Forest Service works with local leadership to establish unified command operations on all wildfires involving local and state resources. The wildfires that ignited in, across the Panhandle in February exhibited extreme fire behavior. Burning in grass vegetation, the fires moved quickly between six and eight miles an hour east, driven by high winds. 
The fires immediately prompted local officials to close roadways, issue evacuations, and request additional personnel and equipment. The Smokehouse Creek Fire, which is now the largest fire in recorded Texas history, spread rapidly and burned more than one million acres. Within 30 hours, the fire had advanced 95 miles into Oklahoma and, was the, and at the widest portions of the fire, it was measured at 35 miles. Within the first 24 hours from ignition, and in addition to the more than 40 local fire departments that responded from across the Panhandle, the Forest Service had 103 agency personnel, 15 bulldozers, 12 engines, and one motor grader responding to the Panhandle wildfires. Additional personnel and equipment continued to arrive in the region, and within 48 hours, once wind speeds were within a safe range, aviation resources were flying the wildfires, drop, dropping water and retardant to assist ground crews. We also leverage the state's rapid response network to bring in assistance from around the country. In total, we served 807 firefighters and support personnel, 136 engines, 26 bulldozers, four motor graders, and 31 aircraft to respond to the Panhandle fires. I want to, again, acknowledge the courageous efforts by local first responders, the tremendous sp response by the men and women who were on the scene from the very beginning until the very end was extraordinary, and we're honored to work alongside them. The primary goal of every wildfire is to ensure, as uh, the primary goal of all responders to every wildfire is to ensure life safety of both the public and first responders. During a high impact event with extreme fire behavior and rapid growth like we experienced in February, firefighters focus on saving lives and property and creating containment line where possible. Every single person who responded to this fire put their lives on the line for these communities. Their courageous efforts and the decisions made by local officials saved countless lives on those days. Once again, I'm thankful I have the opportunity to speak with you today. Any and all lessons learned from this investigation will help our agency serve Texans better. I look forward to working with you. Members, questions? I'll go ahead. Well, we've talked before and I enjoyed our visits before. Um, I've got a few questions though. So like the, the little camp that y'all set up in Canadian, what was the cost on that? Mr. Abraham, I don't know the cost. I can absolutely get that for you. It was extremely impressive. Mm -hmm. I've never seen so many. It looked like the brand new Carnival tent was in town with your cell towers and all that. So that was extremely, I mean, that's where we get into whenever we call the Forest Service and we say, hey, we need a truck. We need some radios. And we'll get nothing. But by God, when there's a fire, we got a couple million dollars worth of equipment coming in. That was nice. Looked good. Go back to, uh, I want to start back on communications that we we're talking about. Now, you probably don't remember, because it's probably before your time, this is like four years ago. We worked extremely hard on getting new communication for all the fire departments. And essentially what it was, it was communication with a tablet in every truck with GPS, Google Earth. So it's, it located all the trucks all the water sources and all the residents, all the houses in each ranch was located. The reason for that was because what we see in the air that is the guys on the ground are lost in the fog of the fire. And they don't know where the water is, they don't know where their, their buddy is, and we don't know when they're in trouble, they don't know where they're at. I mean, we've got a system where it's like everybody turns, you know, when you're in trouble, you leave your, you leave your lights on Everybody else turn your lights off, and that way us air attack can get to you and find you and dump water on you or whatever, and, we, and we've done that. But we had a good system set up with communications, and I would like to go back to that. So like whenever, whenever you guys from out of town come in, you can see where the roads are, where the ranch roads are. And then also our fire department can see when they're on a fire, they can see where everybody else is located. And when somebody has trouble, we have an SOS button. And we all know where to go, right? Why y'all dropped the ball on that, I don't know. It was a good deal. Now, air source, that we're getting back to our, our air. Give me the steps of when I call, I'm fire chief, I want air right now. Give me the steps. Mr. Abraham, it's, it's a 
long answer uh, to your short question. Well, that's what um, I expected. <laughs> to walk through the uh, scenario for aircraft in the state, as uh, has already been indicated, the state of Texas does not own any, any uh, fire suppression aircraft. As has been established, we leverage not have uh, aircraft available 365 days a year. We always try to mirror aircraft resources with the need for them in the state. And this is a very delicate process and very tough process with the conditions that we're seeing right now. Uh, typically, we'll see a ramp up of fire activity. So, you know, as I mentioned in my opening comments, in the Panhandle, we have not seen a lot of fire activity this year since January, only like 19 fires in the Panhandle. So that uh, escalation has been slow. And uh, in a typical year, we will not bring in aircraft when that fire occurrence is low like that. Once fire occurrence upticks, once we see local responders responding to more fires, once the state gets more requests, we will then bring additional resources in, in the form of ground resources or aircraft. So at some point during a fire season, it'll, it'll meet um, a threshold that we determine aircraft could be utilized, should be utilized, and we'll bring those on. So any given day, aircraft likely won't be available unless we have significant fire occurrence occurring in the state or some other un underlying factors are showing that we could potentially have fire occurrence. Drought index, uh, injury release components, those are measures of fire intensity. When those uh, trip triggers, we start to bring in aircraft. And who has to be in place before they're, before the, so the planes, mm -hmm. the planes are sitting on the tarmac. Mm -hmm. They're gassed up and ready to go. We got pilots sitting there, but they can't fly because why? Excellent question, Mr. Abraham. So the planes are just one part of the puzzle. If, if we had aircraft in and they were on the tarmac ready to fly, you still have to have ground resources to support those. The men and women that load the retardant, and there are certain qualifications you have to do that, that you have to meet to be able to load that. You have to have a tanker base manager, somebody that is managing those planes for safety, uh, making sure they're, they're, they're okay. Well, well, okay, you're a contractor. The con, let me back up. The contractor is sitting there on the tarmac okay. with his planes and he's got his ground crew sitting there ready to roll. Okay, now go. Okay, in that scenario, if we have not ordered them, so you're saying maybe there's a contractor at a local airport that has fire suppression aircraft that's ready to roll and we have not placed an order for those aircraft. If that aircraft, aircraft is in the national system, in the national ordering system, we can order it. And once we order it, and once it goes through the U.S. Forest Service, all, all our uh, contracts do for the aircraft, once it goes through and makes the rounds and we get an official green light from National Interagency Coordination Center, NIC, once they give a green light, we can't fly that ship. Well, what if your safety guy's not there? I'm sorry? Well, if the safety guy from the National Forest Service isn't there. Well, so we don't actually have to have the safety person in, in place, but we do have to have a tanker base manager. We do have to have uh, certain individuals that load or qualified to load that plane. So, okay. yes, that so, staffing has to exist. So, you don't have to have a safety guy involved? So, somebody's got to fly in to say, to bless this off. And that is typically the tanker base manager. He or she will say And where is he, coming, he or she coming from? Well, currently we do not have any in the agency to do that. As Director Davis uh, mentioned a moment ago, the last legislative, latest, legislative session, we were blessed with getting additional resources, and we are in the process of hiring those so that we have those in-house. Currently, to your question, uh, they have to come from another agency. Typically, we see them come from out of state. That is a very rare skill set. Unfortunately, that qualification, there's not a whole lot of uh, individuals across the nation that have that qualification. So they are, they are hard to come by, particularly uh, when wildfire occurrence elsewhere in the, in the nation is high. And that's why we're trying to invest in our own program. So, so the pilot is too stupid to do this. <laughs> so I, I don't believe that's the case at all, and the, the pilots that I've seen on these suppression aircraft are amazing, flying the conditions that they do, but there are requirements with those federal contract aviation ships that we have to meet, and those requirements include somebody to manage them. Well, the point I'm getting at, mm -hmm. we had a window. Tuesday morning, we had a window. If we'd had planes sitting on the tarmac, they couldn't have flown. And because we didn't have the, say, the, the, what are the tanker guys sitting there on the tarmac? So on, on Wednesday, we absolutely flew air, aircraft. So well, Monday, no, the fire was, we were, it was in Oklahoma on Wednesday. Yes. I'm talking Tuesday, Tuesday when it was sitting on 
the edge of the Canadian, it was in still in Roberts County, sitting there smoldering because it had been all night smoldering. Tuesday morning, we had a good window. We could have, if we had air, there's a really good chance, and there's a lot of people that were fighting the fire that would have told you this, or Will might tell you this in a minute, we could have held it. But the government, the national government, so to be clear, we did place an order for aircraft, a significant amount of aircraft, on Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning. And those orders were filled by Wednesday, and we were able to fly at 1,200 on Wednesday. We had uh, seven single-engine air tankers flying on Wednesday. Uh, to your point about having a window, if we would have had aircraft on station on Tuesday and they were fully manned and ready to fly. Uh, we would have had issue safely and effectively flying those. The wind speeds that were shown at the Amarillo Airport, uh, at least for Monday and Tuesday, were 20 to 30 mile an hour gu uh, sustained wind, with gusts ranging from 30 to 60. And with the single engine air tankers, these are the, uh, the crop dusters, the air tractors that y'all are familiar with, the threshold for those planes to, to fly, according to National Wildfire Coordinating Group, is 30 knots, roughly 34 miles an hour. So we were at that threshold, and the gust would have definitely taken them out. The threshold, the tolerance under NWCG, National Wildfire Coordinating Group, is a spread, a wind speed, or a wind gust spread of 15 knots, roughly 17 miles an hour which we did see both days. And it's not only a safety factor for those planes, it's also an effectiveness factor. So those planes, as they fly, they, they, they fly low. As you know, those crop dusters, those seats, are about 60 feet off the ground when they're jettisoning the load. The large air tankers are about 150 feet, so a little higher. But the flight profile for those aircraft, either a seat or a large air tanker, it, it's, it's coming in low and slow, just above stall speed. And it's jettisoning a heavy load, which shifts the center of gravity. And so air, wind speed, gust is uh, a dynamic that those pilots uh, know is a high risk. And so that's why those thresholds are relatively low by panhandle standards. I know 30 miles an hour sustained wind happens fairly often in the panhandle, but as a national standard, um, the, they, they typically do not fly over that threshold. And if the wind is over that threshold, they see inaccuracy in getting that retardant to put, put in the right place and or having a good coverage of retardant. It just simply flies away. Yeah, no, I get you. I mean, a 30 mile an hour wind's a, a day off for us here. Yes, sir. Um, you know, and I, I guess the point I'm getting at, the Forest Service, y'all have got national Forest Service stamped all over your forehead. And, I, and that's where I'm getting, and I'm wanting to get the, the point across to these guys next to me, that we need to get away from the national Forest Service. We don't need somebody in California telling us and some non-pilot telling me when I can fly and when I can't fly, right? Because 30 mile an hour wind is nothing. I mean, we fly in 50, 60, 70 miles. Hell, my helicopter go 100 miles an hour. That's 100 mile an hour wind I'm flying in. I can freaking fly in it. And it's not up to some non-pilot person to tell you when you can fly and when you can't fly. And that's where you get this national standard that you get somebody that's a non-pilot telling somebody, a pilot, that they don't know their skills or what their skills are, or when they can fly and when they can't fly, right? Yes, sir. So we need, to, we need to get a little smaller government, right? We need to downsize this thing to a little tighter. Maybe Texas wouldn't be small enough for me. Texas Panhandle would be, because there's a big difference between South Texas and, and Texas Panhandle, right? One other little quick question. So we were talking about carding, and you'll know about this. When you get carded, Aviation guy gets carded, or a guy gets carded. That then makes you available to go any to, to get carded. Now you're available to the National Forest Service to go anywhere. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. So the carding system you're referring to is an NWCG, as I mentioned before, National Wildfire Coordinating Group. It's a qualification. Uh, all of our firefighters and support personnel are qualified to an NWCG standard. That standard is recognized nationally. Uh, you are then can be enrolled into a national database of firefighters and first responders that can be accessed by other states or the federal government in certain times of need. So all of our firefighters, the 300 firefighters we have, do achieve that standard. We do have the option to list them as nationally available. We don't do that very often because we've only got 300 firefighters covering the whole state of Texas. 
But on occasion, we will list them nationally available, so will other states, so, do, so will other federal entities. And it allows firefighters to plug and play across the nation. In my opening comments, I mentioned that we surged in 800 firefighters into the panhandle with these fires. Some of those were other state resources, other state firefighters that came in with that same card that our, fighter, our firefighters have. They were in the national system to be able to, for us to be able to mobilize them. So yes, sir, to your point, once they get that card, once they get that qualification, they can go nationally to support other states' operational needs. We don't have to let them. We absolutely do not let them most of the time just because we're covering so much ground in Texas with our resources. Well, then what's the use of getting a card if you're not gonna let them go? The card is actually useful in the state as well. So it clearly identifies what that resource has been trained to do and been signed off to do. And what it allows for us and other agencies uh, that have that card, other federal agencies, Texas Parks and Wildlife is, is now adopting that card. It allows us to instantly plug and play uh, resources together so that they know you are an instant commander type four. This is what you're qualified to handle. You are a firefighter type one. This is your qualification set. And this is your skill set. So if you don't have the card, then you're probably incompetent. No, sir, not at all. So we have firefighters across the, the state and, and I don't know if it's been mentioned today, but there are over 1,250 volunteer fire departments covering the state. And a lot of those men and women, women men and women are not carded or not qualified to the NWCG standard, and that's fine. They can fight fire all day long in their jurisdiction. That NWCG standard just allows for rostering in a bigger system with a, with a unified qualification system so that they can plug and play anywhere in the state in our operations or in the nation in national operations. All right, I'll pass. One, one second, um, Jason. Um, you asked a couple questions that I believe Chief Kidd is better prepared to okay. answer, and he's already been read into the record. So, Chief Kidd, were you, did you want to respond? Thank you, Chairman. I uh, want to clear up misconception about base camps that come in. Those base camps are under my direction and my authority. We're the one that pays the bill of that out of the Governor's Disaster Contingency Fund. That is not appropriated funds to any state agency setting up here or any that you will hear from today. So I appreciate the comments about how our base camps look nice when they come in, but they come in to support the hundreds to thousands of other local government responders from across the state of Texas that are coming here to help you on your fire. And, and, and I need to be careful about this. As the Chief of Emergency Management Chair of the Emergency Management Council, I can direct the Texas A&M Forest Service to come to this area. You've got 10,000, 10,000 local government firefighters today that are watching this hearing, and all they're hearing from you is you don't want them in your neck of the woods anymore. So I hope the next time you have a fire, I can ask them to come up. And now if that's not what you mean, I need you to redirect, because what we are hearing and what I'm getting texts on and hearing is if they don't want us up there, we're not coming back. And I can't change that. I need your help to do that. Well, I, I mean, I don't mean for you to get up in my face, but here we go. We're, we're trying to investigate what's the problem. We're trying to solve the problem, so hard questions are gonna be asked. So don't, don't, be, don't be getting all up in my face here. What did it cost? Base camps cost us $5 million. And we can't get a truck. It's a different process, and I need you to understand the legislative processes that we are constrained by as well. That money comes from the Governor's Disaster Contingency Fund that they put money into every session. It does not come into our regularly appropriated budgets. The grant funds come from the legislature to these agencies. No matter what we ask for, we get what they give us. And then we appropriate that out. Nobody has asked the question yet, how long does the Forest Service set on the grant money that you give them? That's days, not years. There are more requests than there are resources. And that's the problem that we need to address. That's what we're here for. That question will be coming. Uh, Chairman Burroughs. Okay, Director, I have a there we go. Director, I have a few questions. I'll, I'll try to go brief with them. Have you investigated to determine the causes of the fires? And, and Chairman Burr, Burr, are you referring to the director or, yeah. or myself? Myself. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we have performed investigations on the smokehouse uh, and on Windy Deuce. Both were uh, uh, power line ignitions. Okay. Um, all right. Have you developed a timeline down to the hours of who knew what when and who was activated and how all that worked? So we do have a counting of what resources we mobilized, the Texas a and Forest Service mobilized. Yes, sir, we do have that. Okay, is that written down somewhere where you've gotten a timeline? 
Uh, yes, sir. I have seen the timeline and what uh, TIFMIS resource order, what uh, Texas A&M Forest Service order, and aircraft. It yes, kind sir. of when they were deployed, who made calls, all of that, just kind of, you know, the who, what, when, where, why is the basic, just the facts? It's just the facts, and it probably doesn't get into specifics on who made the calls or, okay, but or who was notified. Will you provide that to this committee so that we can make that part of the report so that we have a timeline to go from about who, you know, whatever you've already developed, you have to create something new, okay. but get that to us so that we can integrate that as we need into our report so we have a timeline to go off. Yes, of. sir. All right, here, here, here are the real questions that I, I have for you since I think that you may be in a great position to answer this. We need to look forward, not backwards. Yes, sir. I mean, that's part of what the committee is doing is not only looking about what happened to figure it out, but I want to know what we need to do differently. So let me ask you a couple of areas. So let's talk about before the outbreaks. Do you plan to change or do differently the way that you're monitoring or doing predictive scheduling? Because what I've heard is this model that you have developed did not basically account or believe this was going to happen because of two things. There was cloud cover and there had only been 18 other fires that had taken place in the panhandle. Are you currently working on a new algorithm or changing something in the predictive analysis of this? Yeah. I appreciate that question. I'd like to share a little bit more background, go a little bit more in depth on what we saw coming and what we didn't see coming. So we didn't have the fire activity. That's a normal indicator. As Chief Kidd mentioned, we're usually two to three weeks away from a fire season anywhere in Texas. And so we usually have a fairly steady ramp up of activity that we can clearly identify. We can see it. We didn't have that this time. Okay. We also have underlying indicators that help uh, service telltale signs that something is building. And that is underlying drought which we currently don't have on, in the eastern panhandle. We also have metrics that we're monitoring fuel conditions, monitoring how much moisture is in the fuel, and those indicators, yes, sir? Oh, go ahead. Oh, did not show uh, a significant increase. So what we had uh, coming up to 26 is red flag conditions. These are conditions uh, identified by the National Weather Service, not us, and publicized by the National Weather Service. Red flag conditions usually indicate higher winds than normal, lower RH than normal. And those can, can, can contribute to an elevated fire environment. Those don't, don't usually translate into what we saw burning a million acres. So we knew red flag conditions existed. And that's why, as Chief Kidd mentioned earlier, we pushed in additional resources. Based on previous red flags in the panhandle, we typically see additional requests for our assistance. So, so did your models catch this or not? I'm confused now. Good question. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a long explanation just because the science is, is Got it. it's pretty deep. And I want, I want everybody to have a good understanding of exactly what we're looking at. And so with red flag conditions, if it was a true red flag day, which it didn't end up being, if it was, we had pre-positioned resources that have historically addressed the request during red flag conditions. So do your models need to be changed or are we treating this as a freak occurrence that probably won't happen again? You know, it's one of those things where it has happened before. This kind of outbreak has absolutely happened before, but the conditions that led up to it have never happened in this So do form. we need to change our models or not? <laughs> well. The meteorologists are looking at that right now, and I want, I want to share. Yet. That's fair. I want to, I'd like to share just a little bit more yeah. on what that condition is that we saw. After the 26th, on the evening of the 26th, after the fires ignited, uh, a collaborative group of National Weather Service, Oklahoma, For Oklahoma Forest Service, uh, Texas A&M Forest Service, met, and they retroactively classified this outbreak as a Southern Plains wildfire outbreak. And this is important because an SPWO, as it's known, is typically forecast three to five days in advance. It Re was reclassifications not. don't usually help, do they? No, that, the fact, that's yeah. exactly right. And this was an anomaly. So historically, we've had 37 of these SPWO events since 2005. 2005 was, was when this was identified. We've had 37 of them. So at some this, point in time, you're going to be able to tell me, are we going to treat this going forward as an anomaly, or are we going to change our predictive metrics? Yes, right? sir. That's exactly right. Yep, I'm going to get there. So of the thir 37 times, this is the only time it occurred under these conditions. And so what it did is it opened the meteorologist's eyes. They had a very unique paradigm on when these kind of large-scale outbreaks could occur. This was outside that paradigm. And so they are looking right now about how did that happen? Why did that happen? And how do we incorporate, to your question, how do we incorporate that new data set so that it doesn't catch us by surprise again? All right, so we may need to change it. That's the answer. Yes, sir. We yes, just sir. don't know yet. All right, planning and staging. Is there anything we need to be doing differently about planning and staging ahead of time, you know, with involving locals or people like that? Or do you know yet? Or you, I mean, 
do you have an opinion today or are you waiting for more information? We're definitely waiting for more information, in particular what that predictive services group, what the National Weather Service comes back with on how they are going to identify these going forward. Yeah, so I, we, I shifted yeah. gears. I'm not talking about the predictive from the National Weather Service and the meteorologists. I'm talking about coordination ahead of time with locals on the ground and kind of staging and getting equipment in place. Do you know that do we do you think we need to be doing things differently or you think it was all good or do you know yet? So, so my answer on that was uh, going down the path of once we have a better assessment on how we can identify it going forward, it will help us better preposition or apply resources more appropriately. And to your the, the follow-up question or the, the B of that question was how do we communicate that? And that is something that we've definitely learned through this response needs to be handled differently. One of the complicators we had on this one was that we had 36 uh, people immediately deployed. Our Amarillo office, our Childress office, our Lubbock office immediately deployed. All of those individuals went tactically. They went in, tried to get people out of the way and take action on the fire. Typically, five of those individuals would have been uh, co-located or made contact with the county judge to provide a constant conduit of information. So the second part of your question, how do we improve communication? We know now we've got to surge in additional resources for that avenue because they were all gainfully employed suppressing the wildfire, getting people out of the way. What resources do you have to surge in? What resources do we currently have to? No, what, what additional resources do you think we need to surge in? So we will be leveraging partnerships with TDM. As Chief Kidd mentioned, those county liaison officers, I think that is going to be a huge benefit where we can utilize them to be the cooperator and the, the liaison with the local officials. Do you agree that we need to do a massive upgrade to our communication system, the actual equipment, so that everyone's on the same channel and frequency? Communication is always an issue. Short answer? Yes. Uh, a little bit longer answer is that when we show up on a fire, we're running VHF. A lot of departments are going 800, 700 megahertz, and it is creating issues. Um, there is no standard for responders to go to. I will say our standard, we follow, again, the National Wildfire Coordinating Group standard for wildland fire. Our radios are able to plug and play on any wildland scene across the nation. But that doesn't always work well when it comes to interacting with local uh, local responders, and they have they have a, a huge menu to choose from on their communication. And every every entity of those 1,250 volunteer fire departments, each entity can choose their own different uh, piece from the menu, if you will. I assume you agree with these two gentlemen. You'd like to have the four to six aircrafts as part of the system that we have control and access to. One thing I've seen, short answer, yes, I do agree that the state needs to acquire a craft. Slightly longer answer, again, is that I think that is just one component. I think ownership does help us control our own destiny, as, as Chief Kidd said. It does allow us to address some of the things that Mr. Abraham mentioned, that we are in more control of those resources. Um, and I think contracting and our leverage of those federal contracts is something that we will continue to have to uh, explore and utilize. How many other states do we coordinate with to respond? How many other states sent resources and assets in here? So through this panhandle response, I believe 36 states sent firefighting resources and support personnel. Okay. Um, and then I guess I just want a reminder, because it's important to me, you're going to provide us with the timeline y'all have already developed so we can make that part of this committee report and look at it as far as respond, uh, becoming aware of the incident, responding to it, and the different uh, allocation of assets or deployment of assets. Fair? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Mr. Hunter. So when you testify here, you're testifying on behalf of the Texas Forestry Service. Yes, sir. So you were just asked that the cause was power lines. Is that correct? So we No, 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 no. Is that correct? That's what you said. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Who? Who's the power line? You said the power lines caused. Tell me who caused it. Our investigation, and we did have law enforcement officers investigate both Smokehouse and Windy Deuce, those investigative reports attributed the cause and origin from a power line. They did not specify who owned that power line. Do you know who? 
I've heard indications. Well, no, 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 I no, said. No, sir, I do not know you know who? No, sir. So, if you did the investigation, that's what you've done, the Texas Forestry Service? Yes, sir. Correct? And you've come up with a report and a timeline that Chairman Burroughs has said, correct? Yes, sir. And you have stated, because I ask you, are you talking on behalf of the Texas Forestry Service, you have stated at least two times the cause was power lines, and you told me yes. Correct? Yes, sir. Why doesn't the report tell me who? Typically, we are only, in our reports, only stating the cause and not who the well, cause came from. Well, if it's a power line, you must know who. I, I believe that information is probably readily available. Well, no, 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 just a second. You told me you're talking on behalf of the Texas Forestry Service. You said power lines caused the fire. Now, and you told us you did a report, and you've done a timeline. Who? I don't have that answer, a firm answer on that. Who does? Tell me who does. Somebody just came up with a report and said, hey, a power line did it. They didn't go out and say, who? Somebody take a look at it, know where it is. Do you know? Our report does not indicate that, no, sir. Why wouldn't you tell everybody in the state who did it? Now, our primary concern on these investigations... No, 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 no. You said the cause was power lines. Did you ignore who the power lines were? Our focus on these investigations is... Did you ignore who the power lines were from? We typically do not care who, we care why and how so that we can prevent it for the next wildfire. How can you prevent it if you don't know who? That's, that's a fair question. That uh, is a fair question. Of the origin and cause that we investigate. Let, let me ask you another way. So if I was sitting there in your chair with the microphone on, and I did a report, and I've heard from all the West Texans and Panhandle folks. Who do you think caused it? Are you asking me who I think? You're the only one talking to me now. Yes, sir. Truly. I, I, now, I'm now, not, let's not do the dance. Well, and I'm I mean, who, no, 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 no. I'm asking you because yes, you said the cause was power lines. And this is a serious issue. Yes, sir. Who? I don't have those facts. Do you know if there's more than one power line? I don't know the answer to that, sir. Have you talked with the Utility Commission? I have not. So who created the report and timeline? So the timeline is created by our operations sections on what resources we deployed when. The report, the investigative report, was created by our law enforcement officers. So you really didn't have any input into this report, you? No, not personally, no, sir. Okay, so if somebody in the state agency Texas Forestry Service did a report that said power lines were the cause, who do we ask to find out who? Well, the location of that power line, the location of that cause is specified in the report. And I would assume somebody could do some research based on that location to see who the ownership of. Have you read the report? Uh, yes, sir. I have read the report. Well, then tell me who. You said if we go to the report, we'll know who. Uh, it just determines the location. I had, did not take any further steps to determine who owns or who is responsible for that location. And so Texas Forestry Service just does a report and says, Power line caused everything. We're not going to check into anything else. Yes, sir. That's the end of your report right there. Yes, sir. Whose responsibility is it to go from there to call? You said the cause, but you haven't told me really a cause. The cause was power line. Understood. You want to know who owns that power That's line. I want to know who owns it, who services it, who looks at it, who took a picture of it. 
I don't have that information, sir. So you did a report without any of that information? Yes, sir. So who has power lines out here? I'm not familiar with that. Who services the power lines out here? I'm not familiar with that either. But the Forestry Service said the cause was power lines. Why? So the investigative report highlights what that investigator saw. Why? How did it cause it? I did read the report, but it's been a few weeks. I don't know exactly what the report says. We can make sure you all have a copy of that report. We want a complete copy, a complete timeline. And by the way, uh, Chairman King, it's 11 a.m. for the contract. You know, I asked for it at 9.45, just so the committee knows. Who in the Texas Forestry Service can answer my specific questions? Uh, and you understand them, don't you? Maybe could you say it one more time, just yeah. so I'm clear. Who caused the power lines that caused the fire? Who owns them? Who services them? Who's there? I don't believe anyone in the Texas Forest Service can answer that factually. I don't think they have the facts okay. or I've done the investigation. How do they know the power line did it? Uh, would have to refer to the investigative report. And other than you, is there anybody else that can tell us why the power line caused it? Uh, the investigating officer could. And who is that? Uh, I'll have to get you that name. I'm not sure. I think we had two separate investigators uh, do the investigation on Okay, this. so Chairman Burroughs, we got your contract coming. We got your timeline coming. We got your investigation report that doesn't have any who in it. And now we have an individual that he's going to give you and Chairman King the names to tell us who, what, when, where the power lines were the cause. You know, and it, it's a really good idea. We're here till Thursday, so if that investigator who did this uh, investigation wants to come testify, that we can find some time, even if it's public. Okay. We can certainly, Definitely look we into can that. certainly squeeze that investigator but, in. Thank you. Chairman. Members, further questions? Chief, a um, couple of things. One, you testified that that the weather leading up to this event was unprecedented. I think nearly everybody in this room would disagree with you. Um, I, I, I think this is very precedented. I think nearly every fire that we've had in the Panhandle would have been very similar weather conditions to this. So I, I, I think that that's a little bit bureaucracy going on, to be quite honest with you. My, my question is, is what has Texas A&M Forest Service done to model fires when we have, you testified, model those weather conditions because Every weather forecaster on the TV in Amarillo, the, the two things that they can hit consistently are winds and relative humidities. You know, and, and we knew well in advance, because I had meetings with all of our guys at the ranch and the neighbors going, guys, this is it. This is the time when these things happen. We've got to all be on alert and be aware. So if I can do that, why does the Forest Service not have the capability to do that? For clarity, these conditions were not unprecedented, to your point. It's often windy, it's often uh, we see low RHR in, in, in the Panhandle. What was unprecedented for those exact conditions to lead to a Southern Plains wildfire outbreak. Historically, what conditions uh, exist for an SPWO were far different than what we saw that day. We expected higher fire activity. We did not expect, no one expected a million acres to burn under those conditions. Absolutely, if you would have told me we would have seen a thousand acre fire, I would have said, yes, sir, that's probably accurate. If you would have told me we would have seen three thousand acre fires, I would have said, yes, sir, I, I believe that. If you would have told me, the meteorologist, the predictive service department, the people that have experienced SPWOs before, if you would have told me we would have burned a million acres under those red flag conditions, uh, we would have said, no, sir, probably not. Actually, the National Weather Service talking with them in a post-mortem review of that, said that there is less than a 1% chance of those, of those conditions leading to an SPWO. And again, to my comments earlier, 
This one did not fit the paradigm. So we are evaluating that with the National Weather Service to make sure we get it in the paradigm for next time. Okay. All right. Um, members, other questions before I move on? I've got a few. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it seems amazing to me that we keep talking about um, we didn't expect this. I've seen the weatherman in Texas be right twice in my life. And one was the, was the big freeze, Chairman Hunter. They were right about that and Texas wasn't prepared. And the weatherman was right about this fire. I knew it for days leading up to the fire. Everybody else seemed to know it. I'm still concerned that we didn't know we didn't have airplanes because we can't even seem to source the contract. But we're going to, you know, we've, we've been down that road. Um, one of the things that I want to know when we did get airplanes and after the 17 fires and we expanded resources up here in the panhandle and stuff and um, all that, you know, we, we have tanks in Dumas, we have a tank in Childress, and there's actually one in Canadian in Hempfield County. And I asked this question to um, Director um, Davis at the um, meeting at the fire station in Canadian when, when the governor came to Hempfield County. Uh, why is that tank in Canadian not utilized? Can you answer that? Uh, I will attempt to, yes, sir. Great. So over the years, we've opened up several tanker bases. And when I say tanker bases, it could just be a tank and maybe the infrastructure to load retardant into a suppression, suppression aircraft. Those tanker bases have been spread throughout the state over the last two decades. Um, we have found a limited number of tanker bases to be really positioned in the, in, the, in a perfect place for us to perform operations. Canadian was one that we culled from the list. It's been used in the past, but because of its proximity to Oklahoma, Dumas served to be a better location for centrally deploying those aircraft. So as you saw in Canadian, there may be some tanks there. We could, in theory, stand that up if we absolutely had to, but we've really tried to focus to 12 tanker bases and run all our operations out of those 12 primary bases. Well, I would say when 75% of Hempfield County burned down, that would have been a great time to have that tank. Yes, sir. I absolutely so, understood. Um, the, but, I, but, you know, we have these resources out here, and one of the things we're going to talk about, and, and I intend on bringing you back up when we get our firefighters up here, because, you know, I want to be clear here. I, I see lots of problems from a communication standpoint, and I see a lot of bad history with the Texas Forestry Service in the panhandle when it comes to water, wildfires. That's undeniable. And you guys are kind of getting beat up a little bit and, and been the target of some of the frustration. But on the other hand, I don't believe for a minute that the Texas Forestry Service caused this fire or that you were the cause that it burned a million acres. I think you're a valuable resource. I think you need to be rebranded. I think you need um, longevity in your, in your ranks. I think your 36 employees need to learn how to fight fire, fires in the Texas Panhandle, and I think we need a communication system. But as the chairman of this committee and intending on leading the efforts to um, rectify the situation going into next session, I intend on the Texas Forestry Service to be a major component going forward. And not every landowner in the Texas Panhandle doesn't want you here. I can name most of them that don't, but because they, they call me. Um, but uh, I, I can also name some some victories that your guys had, and and I can show you many citizens in Hempfield County that were very thankful for you, that don't know what Mr. Abraham has dealt with or what the volunteer fire department's frustrations were. They just know somebody showed up in a different color truck, and put their house out. That's what they know and they appreciate you. So this is, while we are gonna beat you up a little bit and we're gonna talk about past sins, that's not what the, that's not gonna be the theme of the next three days. The theme is, how did you not do that anymore? I never wanna see another bulldozer, really. That's, that's, a, that's a personal thing with me. But there's certain things that you don't need to be doing anymore and there's certain things that you did right and I want to capitalize on what you did right and I want to capitalize on this communication thing. Finally, um, the last question I have, assuming we buy our airplanes and we contract our own airplanes, um, are we still stuck with the National 
Weather Service telling us when we're going to have fires? If it's a state run agency, I don't know which one of you can answer that, but the one of the biggest problems I keep hearing is California. I keep hearing about the National Weather Service. Um, I keep telling um, Mr. Abraham how high the winds can be when he can fly. Now, we got problems with Texas too, I get it, between the landowners and the volunteer fire departments and the Forest Service, we, we, you know, the, we've identified those problems, but one of the main goals of this committee is to take the federal government out of our firefighting business. So when we move forward with a massive appropriation to, to put the resources in place that are no longer governed by the federal contract that we don't have, um, do we still have to follow those standards? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, and I, first I'd like to thank you for your comments that you just made about the wins or the successes that you've seen with this agency. And uh, as, as we've had some very spirited conversations with landowners, we don't always get it right. We, we have a huge turnover issue. I think Director Davis has mentioned it earlier that we are trying to invest in our resources so that we get some stability. So those people, once they're trained, uh, they can be parts of the community and understand fire suppression in the Pando, which is different than East Texas different than South Texas. So I appreciate your comments and I want you to know we are working toward having a stable workforce that can be trained and so that that chalkboard that Mr. Abraham referenced, as we write things down on that chalkboard, those individuals have longevity and have a recollection of what's expected of them. So thank you for your comments on that. As far as aircraft, if the state chooses to purchase aircraft, the state manages those aircraft um, and, and can do what they want with those aircraft. Now, with that said, there are safety standards. They're, they're absolutely every flight is up to that pilot in charge, whether he or she is a state employee or a federal employee or a contract employee. Um, if they feel comfortable flying, they can fly. If they don't, they won't. It is up to them to make that decision. Winds are always going to be a concern with aircraft. Not only for the safety, we may can adjust the thresholds because it's a state air, airplane, but you still have an effectiveness issue. You want to get that retard in, in the right place uh, uh, and, and hit the target every time. You don't want any drift. Well, so. I, I, I understand that, um, Chief. I, I certainly understand that, and I understand that when the winds are predominantly out of the you know southwest and it's 60 miles an hour, the retardant is going to end up in Oklahoma. <laughs> Got that. Yes, sir. What I'm asking you is, you said in your testimony and your questions from Mr. Abraham that determining when we flew were based on National Weather Service standards. You guys had a very spirited debate about that, mm -hmm. honestly. And my question is real simple. Whether it's within the Forest Service or TDM or, or our, state, our state meteorologists, will they make those de decisions going forward once we put this investment in Texas's hands? Or are you still going to tell me that the National Weather Service said how high the winds could be? Because I don't want to hear any more about National Weather Service. I want to hear about what Texas thinks and, I, and back to this regional, regional resources. We, we've been over it and over it that Texas Panhandle is different. You know, when they say Texas is really five states, we're the sixth one. I get it. But what I want to know is uh, if we're going to take the federal government out of this, that means deciding how high the winds can be before Mr. Abraham can fly his helicopter. That, that's, that's what I want to know. Chief, we... Uh, I'll follow up. If it's all right with you, Chairman, I'll follow up after Chief Moorhead. Okay. Chairman, I, it's hard for me to have a definitive answer, but what I will say is once the state controls aircraft, um, they do have a say in how they utilize that aircraft. Ultimately, it's, it's safety first, and as long as we can safely do so, we would not be um, restricted by the standards that I referenced earlier by National Wildfire, Co Wildfire Coordinating Group. Not, not National Weather Service, but National Wildfire Coordinating Group would okay. not be subject to those standards unless we put that plane out to another state then we would be. Right. Okay. Chief Kidd. And, and Chairman, if I may, it, it's a crucial question. I'm, give me just a second to work through it. For the aircraft that we would get, we would determine with the chief pilot of when it would be safe for them to fly. We would not be re relying on any outside entity other than those at this table and that work for you mm -hmm. to make the decision are they available or not available. As pilots know, Pilot in command is the one to ultimately make the decision for when the aircraft flies. I believe we can agree to that, Mr. Abrams. Yes. Second, 
the national weather service will still have an impact in this but it won't be with the state agencies chairman hunter will remember days before hurricane harvey hit when the national weather service and the national hurricane center was saying it was going to be a strong tropical storm to make landfall and we were ringing the bell calling every county judge along the coast telling him it was going to be a major hurricane and many of them said nim we get winds like that all the time the national weather service is saying it's only going to be 50 60 mile an hour winds why do you want me to evacuate and we said because our meteorologists are telling us it's going to be a major storm well nim everybody that's down here on the coast right now is looking at the weather channel and the national weather service and this is the forecast they're given it's going to be real hard for me to get them to pay attention so communications again will be key in our response it won't matter what we say whenever the local meteorologist or the national weather service or the wildfire coordination group is saying it's not going to be that bad we have to continue to beat the drum to say that it will be and this is where our local elected officials and our local firefighting resources are so important in this we have to be on the same page my short answer commitment to you is if you give us the resource we will be in command and won't have outside influence perfect the next thing I want to know on that theme, though, um, communication. Once again, and we're going to we're going to hear communication said over and over for three days. One of the things that needs to happen when we have our own resources, whether it's state owned or and contracted, is the communication with the locals. You know. Um, I know the stories. I was I was there for the for when it was happening, when, um, and Mr. Abraham's not wrong. I mean, the Forest Service said, hey, land, Calvary's coming. Two hours later, you got to the Hobart Ranch. That is a fact. That's not, that's not um, anybody being mad at the Forest Service or anything else. That is a fact. So the guys that were up there fighting the fire, that were putting the fire out, and probably going to save that ranch, got told to land, and a couple hours later, the aircraft showed up. So my point to that is not to rehash past sins. When we write the rules on this, that needs to be part of this. The communication rules need to be in place in statute that when you show up, you know, either you're in command or they're in command, but you take responsibility. I mean, that's the problem. I, as, I, as I've seen it, our local guys are out there fighting fires assistance arrives once again i'm not one that says i don't want the assistance don't ever think that about me but if you show up and you tell the local guys hey we're here now we're in charge then you're in charge from then on it's not hey you volunteers you get to babysit the fire all night we we did our part that's not how that all of those things need to be addressed in in new rulemaking when we get started on this and i hope you're all open to that and and because reiterate one more time i don't want the texas forest service to go away i tend to agree with chairman hunter a new name might help you more than anything but i want i want us to be an asset and work together especially once we're getting the feds out of this this is our opportunity to get this right and i want all of you to be open to those kind of that those kind of rules um uh, based on the funding we're going, we're going to give you. So that's more of a comment than a question. Last thing, Chief, give us 2604 Grant 101. What is it, how it's funded, who gets the money, and why are the, our volunteers the last rung on the ladder? Chairman King, uh, I appreciate you asking that. That is an excellent question. I heard a lot of commentary on 2604, and it is, um, it is a big program, and so it'll take me just a minute. But 2604 program is dollars allocated by the state through the Forest Service to be awarded to those volunteer departments, those 1,250 volunteer departments that have asks. We currently have $172 million worth of unfunded asks in that 2604 program. So that's say that amount again. $172 million. It's unfunded. Unfunded, correct. So currently we get $22 million, just shy of $22 million a year to pass through to departments. We allocate 100% of that every year. So there's nothing left on the table. That money is allocated and passed through to those departments. Uh, to uh, Mr. Abraham's point, 
we have departments out there have waited years. He referenced 10 years. That is not shocking to me. It's disturbing, but it's not shocking. And it's only because we just simply don't have enough money to pass through. Like I said, we allocate all 22 million every single year, 172 million unfunded requests. Those requests are in the form of trucks. They're in form of training. They're in, form, in the form of equipment. Now training, we prioritize. If a department comes to us for training through 2604, we immediately fund it. At the beginning of every fiscal year, we carve out two portions of that allocation. We carve out money for training. If it's not spent at the end of the year, we immediately allocate it before those funds lap for equipment or something else in the program. The other carve out, as you well know, is for, um, is for emergencies when we have catastrophic losses for a department. And so if a disaster de declaration is declared by the governor, funds are immediately available to those responding departments in the form of $15,000 to reimburse anything that they have taken as a loss. So those funds, funds are carved out. Again, if they're not used, at the end of the year they are appropriated. Significant um, need out there by those 1,250 departments. There is a ranking to how requests uh, are handled. I can go over that with you just real quick because Please. I want you to understand the, the secret sauce. It is not secret. Um, we do use several metrics on how we rate fire department requests. So taken into account is the number of years the department has been in existence, the size of the primary 911 protection area, the population of the primary 911 protection area, the distance to viable mutual aid and viable's key, not just because there's another department six miles down the road, but is that department viably available to produce mutual aid to that department? And then also that department is rated based on a county wildfire exposure classification. Uh, so there is a system, Texas Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal, that anyone can go into and evaluate their wildfire risk. That is part of the calculus on how these uh, grants are awarded. So we do have a listing of all the requests and and they are prioritized order one through and I'll be honest with you I don't know how many thousands are in there but one through X number of thousands and as those monies come available the list just goes down and we fund as many as we can until that 22 millions expended. So um, and, and you said uh, while uh, Counties that are in a wildfire risk are down, uh, if I wrote it down right, about fourth or fifth priority down the, down the rung. Yeah, and those weren't listed in priority order necessarily, but that is the metrics that are used, and that is cal county wildfire exposure classification. And basically, it just conveys the average risk of a wildfire in each county. Every county has different exposures. As we've seen in the panel, as we know in the past, there's significant risk here. So if if the legislature appropriated the 172 million that is currently underfunded in the 2604, what is your estimation? I mean, obviously you could bump the 22 to 30 or 40 or whatever to to get all grant requests out the door. What if if you had the the magic legislative wand? What would that look like? That'd be a powerful wand, sir. And if you could, if we could apply $172 million worth of funds to, to buy down that unfunded request out there, we would do so in a heartbeat. The complicator to that would be trucks, very popular in that program. It would take a while to build those out. So if the legislature chose to invest in that program and fund all those unfunded requests, we likely wouldn't see trucks in departments for a year to two years just because of the build rate on those trucks. So on the on the truck, so so you know I think we're talking about fire trucks that we order to be built, and then if you look at our departments in the the kind of military type six by eight they run, they get the truck, and these guys um, don't speak just nod your head. You build your own trucks once you get the truck, correct? I'm getting a lot of nods back there. So we're not talking, we're talking about, once again, I wanna go back to the Texas Guard and the surplus of military trucks that are out there. If the departments could get those trucks, would that necessarily have to flow through the 2604? No, sir. We actually have another program called, it's 
odd name, it's a federal program. It's um, Federal Personal Property Program, but what it allows is defense, uh, Department of Defense property, like Deuces, those are very popular, Humvees are very popular. It allows those vehicles to be acquired by the U.S. Forest Service, given to the Texas A&M Forest Service, and then handed out to local departments. There is a waiting list for those as well. Um, those historically have been a little more available than they are the last few years. They are hard to get. That Department of Defense um, surplus, as they call it, is available to anyone in the nation, any natural resource agency like ours that works with cooperators, work with fire departments. So we are in competition for those. But we love that program. It's an awesome program. There's just not a whole lot of equipment that we can access every year. But I want to talk about the Texas Guard, mm -hmm. not not going through the the U.S. Department of, of Defense. We we we've learned a lot in Texas about what Texas can do with the Texas Guard because of border security. Um, what um, what is prohibiting the Texas Texas from using its own Texas Guard resources that aren't being utilized by the Texas Guard to have a state program outside of the Department of Defense. And I'd be happy to look into it. I believe that still rates routes through the Department of Defense, but it looks like Chief Kidd ha does have a, an answer for that. Chief Kidd. Chairman, if I may, uh, I want to go back and talk to Major General Selzer, the Texas Adjutant General, runs the Texas Military Department. I want to differentiate between the National Guard, Texas Army, Texas Air National Guard, and the State Guard, which is the third component and who actually has those resources. Are they under state control, or as Chief Moorhead said, are they federal resources? I don't know the answer to that. We owe you an answer to that. We will find the answer to that. Thank you. I will, this committee looks forward to knowing the answer to that. And I think our local departments that could utilize those vehicles would like to know that, that answer as well. Um, finally, uh, on, the, on the train, on, on well, let's go back to 2604 when it comes to trucks. Yes, sir. I know in, after the 17 fire up, up here, one of the things that we worked on in the legislature and with the Forest Service was the way the 2604 grant worked where at that time, prior to 2019, you could only request a new truck. There wasn't grant money for repairs. That There is now, or there, we changed that in 19. And... Um, which I think is helpful. But one of the things I continue to hear, particularly from these small volunteer departments that are still filling the boot and having bake sales, these guys are doing, they're building their own trucks, they're fighting the fire, they're largely funding their their own departments um, and, and certainly counties are, are funding them. Who's supposed to write these grants? Does the grant system have to be quite as complicated as it is now? Or is there a way, it, money's one thing, but if the grant program is still as complicated as it seems to me, and I know it's better after 2019, yeah. you guys helped make it a lot better, but it's still not easy. It's still not to where the, the local volunteer fire chief can fill out the paperwork and, and have it eligible for approval. So what can we do within the Forest Service and the management of the 2604 grant to make sure that these departments that are struggling with grant writing don't have to struggle? Yes, sir. Good question. We've tried to make it as easy as possible. If we have fire chiefs out there that are still struggling, we'd be happy to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and walk them through the process. We've actually just created something called Fire Connect. It is basically your Amazon of 2604 where you go in and fairly rapidly, and I just did it myself the other day, input the data. Who are you? What are you? What do you want? And it's check boxes on what you want. And then you can log back into that program, Fire Connect, and see what your status is. When did you put in the grant? How long have you been in there? Uh, and it'll update you on your standing. Are you still in good standing? Do we need additional information from you? Have we not heard from you for a while? Do you need to input some extra data? So Fire Connect is, is new is new and we're going through training right now with local fire departments to understand and we have a, a wide range of departments of those 1250 that I mentioned there's a wide range of comfort with uh, working on a computer and inputting that data if a fire chief fire staff does not want to use fire connect absolutely we'll do a paper version and we will send a fire coordinator out coordinator out to work with that fire chief to get the the data input like I said we spend 100 percent we allocate 100 percent of the funds um, and we want to make sure people have access to it, so we try to make it as easy as possible. Okay. Um, the last um, 
thing, just a point of clarification. Uh, when we were when we were talking about communication, when Chief Kidd first started testifying, we were talking about why how TDM, when it was part of DPS, had access to county um, sheriff's office stations for dispatch and that kind of thing. And then once they went to A&M, they do not have access. Is that the same for the Forest Service? We typically do not operate on local SO. Uh, we typically just stay on the fire channels. And we do have good access for those departments that have VHF. We do have good access and a common operating channel for that. We do not correspond with law enforcement or SO typically in our radios. It's just fire to fire. So we do have that access as long as the local department has VHF. Okay. Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt. So I got your report here. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> just like a fire. It was quick. It was quick, yes, sir. So let me read this in your report. The origin and cause investigation conducted, that was by Texas Forestry Service, right? Yes, sir. On the Smokehouse Crate fire revealed evidence in the specific area of origin that consisted of a power pole with wires and cross member attached that had broken off at ground level causing the pole to fall to the ground in an easterly direction. The power lines made contact with the ground and fine grassy fuels, thus causing a spark or molten metal to ignite the fuels causing a wildfire. Burn indicators in the specific area of origin show advancing fire in an easterly direction. Fire cause is to determine to be power line. Is that right? You remember that from that report? Yes, sir. That's you just true. you just needed me to remind you of that conclusion. Correct. So I knew it was power line, and you've outlined the complete details in the report. Yes, sir. Well, no, not the complete detail. That's just the conclusion. Okay. So who did this report? Uh, the officer's name should be on that report. Again, I don't know which law enforcement officer, but it should be found in there somewhere. All right. Do you, and do you have that? Is that Officer Kevin Pierce? He is one of our law enforcement officers. And where does he live? So he is uh, based out of our Hudson office that is in, located in East Texas. So East Texan came up to the panhandle to find out that there was a power pole. Yes, sir. Okay. So... It, he is the one that you and your director are relying on for the cause of this fire. He's the one that did the report, yes, sir. Well, I know he did it, but do you rely on it? Yes, sir. He is an investigator for okay. us. Okay. Now, here's my question for you, since you spoke on behalf of the Forestry Service. Nobody tells me whose power pole it was. Is that how you all do reports? You just stick a general term in there and you don't tell us who it is? Yes, sir. That's how you all do reports. Okay. So how did your investigator know that the pole fell to the ground in an easterly direction? So our investigators all have training, including FI-110, FI-210, FI-T-310. These are investigative courses related to fire origin and cause. They also complete uh, multi-position task books. Now, this is also a National Wildfire Coordinating Group qualification, so typically takes them two to three years I, to complete look, that. Look, I, I get what you're giving me, some general stuff. Look, did the guy show up there? Our investigator was on scene, yes, sir. So this Kevin Pierce showed up? Yes, sir. Based and on so that he had to say, guys, there's a pole on the ground, and it was easterly, correct? Based on our report, yes, sir. All right. Then he says it made contact with the ground in fine grassy fuels. So to know it was fine grassy fuels, he must have seen something, right? Yes, sir, I would assume so. Okay, and then he says causing a spark or molten metal to ignite the fuels causing a wildfire. So he had to find something specific, correct? I would believe so, yes, sir. And 
do you believe he knows whose pole that was? I believe that report did not indicate it. I do not know what. Uh, well, I can tell you knows. the conclusion doesn't tell me yet. But you have all the faith in Kevin Pierce, don't you? I believe he is thoroughly trained and knows how to investigate a wildfire. Yes, sir. So you got faith in him, right? To perform his job, yes, sir. Yeah, the answer is yes, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So don't you believe in your heart of heart that knowing that there was fine grassy fuels, that it was a power pole, and it fell in an easterly direction, that old Kevin might know whose pole it is? I can't speak to what Officer Pierce knows or does not know. Are you a lawyer? No, sir. Okay. Sound like you have been refined. Now, but you're, you keep winking up here, you know. No, that's good. I'm glad because we're going to see you back. I, I know, sir. Yes, and sir. the deal is I'm going to be waiting to meet with Kevin Pierce. Is that his name? And will you all make arrangements with Chairman King and Chairman Burroughs and our other two panelists to get him up here so we can find out why his report does not say who the poll was and why you could find out those specifics and not specify? Yes, sir. We will reach out immediately following this. Thank you. Mr. Davis. Yes, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, that we've I've already texted and we're working on getting in contact with Kevin Pierce to get an answer to that question. Well, the one thing I've learned, I hope you get him on the right plane here. That's what I'm concerned about. From Chief Kidd, do you have a response? Chairman, if I may, and I, I do hesitate to jump into this, but I'm going to. This report is more like a coroner's report of how a, what first, time? a coroner, a medical examiner, of how the fire started, but the coroner's report doesn't say who killed the individual. And I, I'm hoping that there's other members that I think are coming up from the Public Utility Commission and others that will be able to define ownership of the poll that may or may not have transferred over time to this particular point in time of who owns it. But this report was how did it start, not who was responsible for the start of it. And, and I think we're going to get to the answer that you want and everybody in the room wants. I think most of the people in the room have an assumption or know already. I'm, I'm not educated to how it actually, who actually owns the poll. But I do want to be clear in, in fairness to the investigation of this report. It was how it started, not who was responsible for the start of it. Where I respectfully disagree with you, Chief, is this time the evidence was there. In the example you used, there was no evidence. This was specific except for one bit of information. And to me, everything you're talking about that you defended on behalf of the Forestry Service and everything, you wouldn't have had to do if there wasn't a fire, were you? That's true. So to me, let's get down to the basics. I feel like, Chairman, this is a preview of coming attractions. Maybe we'll get the main film by Thursday. But the bottom line is I'm going to have questions on why you can go into details and leave off key factors. Look, everybody in here, let's just get the facts out, be honest. We're an investigative group. I just want to make sure everything is before this committee and then we can build around it. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Burroughs. A yeah, couple quick questions. Do you track the number of fires by how they actually originated up here in these parts? Yes, sir. Our database goes back to the early 2000s, I believe. Do we have a percentage of how many wildfires were started by power lines? I don't have that with me. I believe we can query that data and get that to you. You can get that to us. I believe so. But there's certainly a culprit. There's certain power lines are certainly a culprit. Uh, power lines have caused ignitions in the past. And these two reports that you produced to us, by the way, thank you for getting those to us so quickly, both had power lines as the reason. Yes, sir. Is that sir. fair? Yes, sir. Okay. And do you, as, do you all also oversee fire prevention? Yes, sir. Do you do, rather than just find doing the coroner's report, I love, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, 
do you go through and have the investigators ask other questions, such as, you know, were there warnings or conditions or other information that existed beforehand such that this shouldn't have happened in the first place? Yeah, I, I don't know for certain on power lines. Uh, I'm not familiar. I have to defer to the LE, the law enforcement. Okay. And you think that the investigator coming up here will be able to answer for us the types of questions they can ask to try to figure out how they can prevent other uh, power lines from causing fires? Yes, sir. I believe so. All right. Thank you. Members, further questions of this panel? And I hope you all can stay around because I'm not sure, that I'm, I'm relatively sure somebody's going to have a question after the next panel comes up and we'd like to be, be able to recall you to, for, for, as resource witnesses. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just make the formal request from the dais that Officer Kevin R. Pierce before, be, come before this committee sometime in the next three days to answer the question since obviously we can't we can't get an answer for. I know um, we had not planned on him being here, so when he does get here, we will squeeze him in and get through that line of questioning and move on. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. So at, uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so so this com the committee intends on taking a short break for for lunch. Uh, we will we will reconvene at ten minutes after twelve, um, and starting with panel two. Um, panel two, if you don't see the agenda, is uh, Luke Bodeker, Derek Holdstock, Paul Hanneman, and Emmett Webb. Um, we will we'll be back at twelve ten. So if there's no objection, the committee will now stand at ease until twelve ten.